Faith Fulfilled Book 1 Mike's Legacy Chapter 1 The Origination One of the questions that many ask throughout their lives is, How did the world begin? Why are we here? How are we here? Who or what created us and why? What is our purpose in this world? Those questions have circled endlessly throughout the course of history and time. Very few can say they know the answer. In the Minecraft realm, though, there is a definite answer. In the beginning of time, there was a void. Nothing but darkness and silence filled this empty void. However, there was one being who existed within this void. His name was Notch. No one knows where he came from. In fact, nobody really knows who he truly is. But what we do know is that he created everything. He created the deep blue seas, the seemingly endless sky, the soft, gentle winds, and the swaying trees. He also planted the seeds to all life forms. The soft sheep, the growling wolves, the cowardly ocelots, the splashing squids, and even us. Notch knew, in order for this world to sustain itself without him interfering, it would have to have a balance. A balance between the forces of creation and destruction. Creatures naturally have the ability to reproduce, which covers the side of creation within the balance. These creatures also needed to eat, so they hunted on one another, which satisfied the need for destruction. Life is to be created, then destroyed. If there is too much destruction, then eventually all life on the planet will be wiped out. Too much creation, then over time there wouldn't be enough room on the planet to hold all the life being created. One side cannot overpower the other for too long, or the delicate balance will be broken, dooming the world and those who live in it. However, us humans seem to be outside the forces of destruction. We reproduced, but no creatures haunted us as we are on the very top of the food chain. Notch realized that this could be a very big problem, so he made it so human hearts can be corrupted by evil. Like creation and destruction, there has to be a balance between the forces of good and evil within the human race. This balance echoes the other, as good, the force of forgiveness, kindness, and peace, represents creation, while evil, the force of hate, malice, cruelty, and greed, represents destruction. Those corrupted by evil typically kill, which satisfies the need for destruction within the human race. As the course of history moved along, Notch quickly realized that humans are incapable of maintaining the balance, as far more of us were becoming corrupted than Notch originally thought. The hearts of men are just too easily seduced. Notch had to find a way to restore the balance before it was too late. He then decided that he would gift a bloodline whose descendants would be the ones who maintain the world's balance. The first of the bloodline born with the duty of maintaining balance would be born. This man would be gifted with special abilities so that he may easily fight off whatever it is that is threatening the balance. These abilities were supernatural. You could call them superpowers. The most powerful ability by far that Notch gifted this being was the ability to open a portal to the nether by simply opening his palm. The nether, a place where the balance breakers go to be eternally tormented until they can be saved. In the palm of his hand, the portal screams open and sucks in the balance breakers, forever sealing them away. The power began being known as the Legacy, due to the fact that once the man died, his offspring would also be gifted with its power. Many other abilities were given to what were known as the Legacy Holders. Abilities like being able to shoot balls of fire from their bare hands, or being able to create tsunamis by calling to the ocean deep striking down lightning from the heavens to split entire mountains into two, or summoning a tornado straight down from even the calmest of clouds above. However, the legacy holders chose to live just like any other human, only using their abilities when absolutely necessary. Powerful beings they are, yes, but they were also human. As such, they were not invulnerable to the forces of darkness. Millions of years would pass, and one legacy holder after another was born and died. People were thriving in these times. Cities, 
towns, villages scattered across the world. It was truly Minecraft's golden age. But like all good things, it eventually came to an end. Over time, as each legacy holder lived and died, the next would be more and more corrupted by darkness. The earlier legacy holders were easily able to ignore it, but as time went on, the newer ones became more and more seduced. They began doing things that were forbidden of them, and began ignoring things that were a threat to the balance. Eventually, one legacy holder fully embraced the evil within him, and began attacking the people of the world with the legacy's power. This legacy holder embraced the evil within halfway through his life. However, his offspring would accept it from birth. The legacy had been corrupted. The shift in the world's energy from neutral to evil caused the birth of different creatures. Monsters, who hunted at night and fled from sunlight. These creatures were loyal only to the legacy holders, which led some to believe that the dark legacy holders created them. One by one, the free people of the world fell to the power of the legacy. The legacy which had been twisted, perverted, and corrupted by those who wielded it. Many believed that Notch would step in and stop them before they themselves caused the balance to break. But, he never came. The delicate balance, the one that Notch worked so hard to create, the one that these men were created to protect and maintain, was broken. As centuries turned into millennia, the world fell further and further down. Life was being extinguished at rates beyond imagination. 500,000 years, the world was out of balance. Still some life was clinging on. But the cities, towns, and villages were destroyed. Towers collapsed. Houses burned. Windows shattered. A planet with civilization was replaced by just biomes. The biomes once filled with so much now had nothing but their natural inhabitants. Some small villages survived, but eventually they too will be obliterated. A new legacy holder is born, this one named Andrew. Andrew was born unusually powerful with the legacy. Unknown to his parents, he would grow up to be the most powerful legacy holder to have ever lived. That and the most evil, and the most destructive. Andrew would lay waste to what was left of civilization. Andrew was far more evil than his forefathers. While those before him destroyed just to destroy, Andrew did it to inflict pain, to inflict fear, to suck the hope out of the innocent. Andrew's first victims were his own parents, the ones who taught him everything, the ones who gave him life. Andrew saw them as merely obstacles in his way. His forefathers would destroy life instantly, but he would draw out the process to inflict as much pain and fear as possible before stealing his victim's right to live. Andrew would eventually have an offspring of his own. Two sons, Brian and Ray. They too were born powerful with the legacy. However, not nearly as much as their father. Brian and Ray would be trained by Andrew to use the legacy. For a short time, Andrew's assaults were seized while he trained his sons. Brian, just like a machine following its programming, embraced the evil in his heart. Ray, however, wasn't as easy to be seduced. Andrew pushed for Ray to just embrace it and fulfill his destiny. The boys would grow in age and in power as their father watched with pride. As Ray grew, so did the conflict inside of him. You have too much of your mother in your boy, Andrew would say to Ray. The people of this world are weak. We are doing them a favor by exterminating their pathetic, useless lives. Ray would nod each time he would hear these words. Part of him wanted to believe it, but another screamed for him to abandon it. Ray was almost fully grown, and the conflict inside finally began to seize as one side was beginning to overpower the other, the light inside had finally prevailed. Now redeemed, Ray tried to redeem his brother and father. This is not the way, Ray said. The people of this world are not weak, they are just not as strong as us. 
We should be living among them, not destroying them. Can't you see how twisted our ancestors have been? How twisted we are being? We are destroying this world. But we can still save it. There's still a chance. Andrew looked down on his son in disappointment. I always knew you'd be a failure, Andrew would say, with hate staining his blood red eyes. You're weak, just like your mother. As such, you will join her in oblivion. Andrew reached out with his arms and grabbed his son by the neck. Ray pushed back with a blast of air, freeing himself from the deadly grasp. A long and bloody battle would begin. A battle between father and son. A battle between the forces of light and dark. The battle that would decide the fate of the planet. Both sides got their strikes in. However, Andrew was just far too powerful for Ray and was gaining on him. Ray knew this, and as such he diverted the battle into a rainy jungle, where there were plenty of places to hide. Andrew and Ray with their inhuman strength disintegrated vines and trees wherever they went. Andrew with his unbelievable power and control over fire burned everything in his sight, except for what he was aiming for. Ray continued to deflect the fire blasts in every direction to avoid being cooked alive. Andrew's attacks were beginning to become less and less accurate as he was being blinded by pure rage. Ray noticed this chance and took it. He landed one final blow to his father, pushing him back miles into the trees behind. Ray then took off from the entire biome itself, out of sight. Andrew regaining his posture would search and search, but to no avail. Ray was long gone. Realizing this, Andrew let out a scream, fueled by pure rage and hate that in turn created a crater in the center of the jungle. Although neither father or son was victorious in the battle, the forces of darkness had been as the world's balance would continue to fall in the years to come. Ray would run, and run, and run, as fast as his legs could carry him. He could hear his father's screams in the distance. After what seemed like an eternity of running, he finally stopped. Gasping for air, he looked at his surroundings. Grass, trees, rivers, and flowers surrounded him. But he could also see in the distance, what seemed like a village? No, it couldn't be. All remaining life was destroyed, right? Ray limped towards the village, his legs about to give away after all the strain he put on them. When he entered the village, he was shocked to see a few villagers still alive. The town showed signs of being attacked before. Broken windows, scorched marks on the cobblestone roads, trees stripped of their leaves. The sense of uneasiness the villagers felt, and the scars on their faces. He knew he would never show any signs of being a legacy holder to them, or else they'd run in fear. But exhaustion was beginning to take hold. Before he knew it, darkness took him, and he collapsed onto the ground. Ray awoke to a scene he didn't remember leaving off in. It looked like a house. Before he could ask any questions, a white-robed villager entered the room. Huh, you're finally awake, the man said. Where am I? asked Ray weakly, still not fully recovered. You're in my village. You came to us from the east. We thought you came to trade with us, but then you suddenly collapsed. Tell me, what happened to you? Ray paused to think of a response. He couldn't possibly tell them what happened with Andrew. I was ambushed by, uh, zombies. Ray said nervously. Zombies? Ah, yes. A nasty group of troublemakers they are. They always attack our villages, seeking to turn us into one of them. Well, it would seem you avoided becoming a zombie, since, well, I don't see you having green skin or the urge to attack me. Huh. <sighs> yeah, of course. Ray chucked. It's best you stay here and rest and let those wounds of yours heal. Wounds? Ray asked. He removed the blanket and looked around his body. Burn marks, gashes, and bruises covered him. I don't remember taking this much damage. Ray thought to himself. Oh, I almost forgot to ask. What's your name? Oh, it's Ray. 
My name is Ray. Ray answered in a matching polite tone. Pleasure to meet you, Ray. My name is Rob. I am the healer of this village. On behalf of my people, we are happy to have you. Well, Rob, thank you very much for taking me in during my time of need. Ray smiled. Very good. Now, is there anything I can get for you? Warm soup? Any wounds that need stitching or bandages? I think some soup would be nice. Rob left the room, and the silence that Ray woke up to returned. Why did Father feel the need to attack these people? They're such pure beings that never wanted ill will to anyone, Ray thought. Ray would stay with the villagers until he was fully healed. Once he did, he thanked them for their kindness and went off on his own. He was on the run, as he knew his father and brother would be hunting him down for his betrayal. At times he could almost feel their hatred in the air. The fact that he alone holds the duty of restoring balance was a burden beyond imagination. He knew he couldn't do it alone. However, himself, his father, and his brother are the only beings in the world who hold the legacy's power. The last of the Campbell bloodline. When he left the village, all he had was a few loaves of bread, kindly gifted to him by the villagers, and the clothes on his back. The Campbell family, before being gifted the power of the legacy, were survivalists. The instinct to survive was planted within them all for generations. However, after the family was tasked with maintaining balance, the desire to be survivalists was replaced by the will to maintain balance. Of course, this didn't last, but Ray still held some of that survivalist instinct. He used it to help him cut down trees, build tools, mine, and even build. He built small shelters for himself to protect from the monsters of the night, as they too, on Andrew's orders, were hunting him. Another thing that Campbells were known for was their dueling skills. Andrew taught Ray and Brian how to use the sword and to survive a deadly duel. They were specifically tasked to ignore villagers and other basic life forms and to hunt down and destroy Ray. Ray would run into them on occasion and would easily outperform them in the duel striking them down within the first two minutes of the duel most of the time. These skills of dueling would be essential for not only him, but the future descendants for their adventures in the future. Faith Fulfilled Mike's Legacy Chapter 2 Birth of the Braveheart Ray only stayed in his shelters for a brief time. He didn't want to stay in one place for too long as to lower the chances of his family or their minions finding him. Walking the forests of Minecraft, Ray could hear a struggle somewhere. Naturally, like a fighter, he followed the sounds and he would soon find its source. A girl, all alone, was fighting a horde of zombies and skeletons. Ray took out his white iron blade and jumped in to help her. He thought she'd be the stereotypical damsel in distress, but she was proving that she can hold her own for quite some time but the amount of enemies in front of her was just far too much. She had bite marks, and arrows all over her, and the fatigue of fighting so many monsters was visible in her staggering steps. Ray was trained by his father on how to deflect incoming arrows with his sword, and so he performed it with elegance. With each swing of his blade, more monsters fell. During a small lull of the fighting, he turns to the girl. You all right? Ray asked with concern. Yeah, I am now, the girl would say, surprised that anyone was around to help yeah! her. With the girl's confidence restored, she got on her feet and drew her chipped iron sword. Ray would draw his diamond sword, dropping the broken iron blade he was wielding before, and together they charged at their enemies. The agonized screams from the monsters and battle cries from two living warriors filled the air clangs of iron and diamond swords, the shots from arrows and blood from hard punches surrounded the area. A few elite zombies were present, and Ray battled them all at once, slaying each of them. Backs against one another, they fought like a perfect team, each one's offensive and defensive strategies complementing the other. It was like two halves of the same whole fighting as one. The few surviving creatures would flee, 
giving victory to Ray and his new friend. Oh, what a fight that was, the girl would say, letting out a long breath of relief. Yeah, it sure was, Ray answered. The two put their respective swords into their inventories. Then they took a long look at one another. Silence would follow, as they looked into each other's eyes. What is your name? Ray would ask, breaking the long silence. Amy. My name is Amy Wintry. Thank you for helping me out there. She would answer. My name is Ray I mean, uh, Jones. And, uh, no problem. Ray would answer nervously. It was known throughout the world that the Campbells were the legacy holders. Having her know that he was a Campbell could either make her run in fear or drive her to try and kill him right then and there. We fight really well together, don't we? Amy would say, a small smile making its way to her lips. I was going to say the same thing, Ray said, with a matching smile. Although it was not known to them yet, this would be the beginning of a long companionship. They would stick together and survive together. Ray and Amy would fight alongside one another in plenty of other battles. During these battles, it became more apparent to Ray that Amy, while talented with a blade, needed to learn to duel if she was going to survive. Ray would teach Amy the basics in how to duel with a sword. Amy was a bit sloppy at first, but eventually she caught on and became an excellent duelist. She would never surpass her teacher. Over time, the two would develop feelings for each other beyond that of friendship. They kept it to themselves for a while, as they were afraid of rejection. That, and because their own survival was more important than any romance between them, they would do everything for each other. Mining, fighting, hunting, fishing, building, you name it. Their feelings for one another grew with every day. Ray was conflicted about admitting his feelings to her. I can't be with her unless she knows who I really am. Being with her while living a lie would just be unbearable, Ray thought to himself. Amy had told him before that her family was murdered by the current legacy holder. Ray knew that it must have been either his father or Brian who committed this act. Ray and Amy had known each other for a year and a half now, and now they each lived in a permanent home, their houses right across from each other. The houses were located in an area hidden with a tall forest so that the legacy holders and their minions would have trouble finding them. The forest had its own decent-sized lake for fishing. This would be their food supply. At the heart of the forest, there was a huge ravine, which connected to seemingly endless caves. Iron, coal, redstone, and gold were everywhere. And of course, being a forest, it had no shortage of trees, which satisfied the need for wood. It was rare that they ever needed to leave the forest. Because of this, things began to settle down for the pair. Amy saw the time was right to confess her feelings to Ray. By the end of it all, they were officially a couple. However, Ray couldn't will himself to tell Amy who he really is. Shortly afterward, they'd abandoned their old houses and used many of their resources to build a new house to live in together. This would prove to be a mistake, because shortly after the house's completion, it was assaulted by hordes of monsters on the behalf of Brian. Andrew had found out that Ray had found a partner and was not pleased, because Andrew knew that if Ray were to have any offspring, they would become a threat to him too. So he commanded Brian to send his minions to destroy Ray before he could have the chance to have children. Brian, underestimating the skill his brother possessed, was defeated every time he sent an attack on their house. These constant assaults caused the couple to be on the run once again, building small shelters to live in for short amounts of time before having to move on again. Eventually, Ray did tell Amy of his origins. He told her of his abilities, his father and brother, everything. Ray, expecting to be left alone from that point, waited. But the rejection never came, and Amy never stopped smiling. 
I know. I know, Ray. I've known for a while now. She said with a comforting voice. B but how? How could you possibly- Pretty sure you lifting the water from the lake with just a lift of your arm is something only a legacy holder is capable of. Plus, why else would all these monsters be just attacking us? <laughs> Amy said, giggling. How come you didn't leave me then? Our family murdered so many innocent people. Ray asked with confusion. You're not like them. Not anywhere remotely. If you were like them, you would have killed me the first night we met. Amy replied. Now, with a clear conscience, their relationship only grew. For years they continued to be hunted, and for years they continued to run. One day, on an unusually peaceful day, with no assaults from monsters, no hurricane force storms, created by Andrew himself in an attempt to wipe them off the planet, unbeknownst to anyone on the planet, the seeds of hope and change were planted. Amy was pregnant. But not with just an ordinary child. This was the child that is destined to destroy the darkness looming in the legacy, redeem the Campbell name, and restore balance to the world. Andrew's worst fear had been realized. A child, given the gifts of the legacy, was born. This child, like Andrew, was born unusually strong with the legacy. Ray felt this child's extreme power almost immediately after his birth. At first, Ray had felt joy and hope for the future. Imagining himself training the boy to use his power, envisioning a world of peace and order that his son had brought. These happy thoughts were soon to be put to rest, however, as more dark thoughts clouded his mind. The room darkened, but it was just midday. How could this be? Ray found himself in a black void with nothing, nothing but a figure in the distance. What is this? Did I fall asleep? Ray thought to himself. His natural curiosity drove him to get closer to the unmoving figure. As he got closer, he got a better look at who the figure was. Notch? No, that's impossible. I must be dreaming. Before he could say another word, the figure put his hand on Ray's head. Ray began being shown a variety of visions. His son, growing up into a man, turning into a warrior just like his father. But the positivity from these visions stopped there. Ray saw a young warrior, blinded by rage, attacking a scared girl. The same warrior, with the palms of his hands, shooting infernos of fire down into villages and towns below. The vision then turned to this man, kneeling down before... No, it couldn't be. Andrew? Now seeing the same warrior with dual blades striking down his own friends and family, this man showing no remorse for any of these horrible deeds. The figure took his hand off Ray's head, and the vision stopped. Ray looked on at the figure. Notch, what have you shown me? Ray said with a weak voice. The void began turning back into the room he had previously been in. The figure would slowly fade away as Ray would be brought back to reality. As he caught up with his breath, he began to think long and hard about what he had just seen. Ray looked down at his newly born son, but not with joy as most fathers do, but with fear. Fear of what he could become. Fear of what his child could bring upon the world. He couldn't live with himself, knowing he had created the world's own destruction. Ray would go to Amy, with the scenario he had in mind, of how much evil and how much destruction their own son could bring on to the world. He proposed that he must never be allowed to realize his powers. Amy reluctantly agreed that for the safety of the world, it had to be done. What started out with such promise would now end with tragedy. Ray would take his own son far away from his home. 
Ray would find a decent-sized village and decided to leave the boy with them. He instructed them to take care of him and to keep him from harm. Before the villagers could respond, Ray took one final look at his son, then turned and walked away. The child cried out loud, almost as if he knew he was being left behind. Faith Fulfilled Mike's Legacy Chapter 3 The First Clash He will be coming soon, Ray said with a hint of fear in his voice. What do you mean? Who's coming? said Amy, with concern. He must know by now that his army of monsters won't be enough to take us down. Brian will personally confront us. It's only a matter of time. Ray's prediction did eventually come true. As the sun rose over the horizon, and the winds blew over the ocean near the new shelter, Ray felt it in his bones that he was approaching. Grabbing Amy, Ray pulls her into a hug, holding her so tight that air began to leave her lungs. Pulling out of the hug, he looks into Amy's eyes. Listen to me very carefully, Amy. Brian is on his way as we speak. I want you to run as far away from here as you can. Understand? Ray said with a stern face. I'm not leaving you behind! Yelled Amy. You don't stand a chance against him. I know my brother inside and out, including his weaknesses. So just trust me. Now go! Ray yelled back. Dark clouds began emerging above in response to the massive dark energy emitting from below. Amy wanted to help him so very bad, but she knew that this was something she did not possess the strength to have any part in. So she ran, ran as fast as her legs could carry her. Ray looked on in the distance, waiting for his brother to show himself. What a surprise, said a voice in the distance sarcastically. Still a coward as always, I see. Ray clenched up, as Brian showed himself through the bushes. Coward you call me. You and father always attack the weak and defenseless. That seems like cowardice to me. Ray said angrily. Well then, it's time to continue that pattern with you then. Brian said with a wicked smile on his face. Both brothers stood facing one another, waiting for the other to make the first move. A long pause would follow. Until Brian would break it, saying, Tell me, did you really think you could save the boy? I don't know what you're talking about. Ray lied through his teeth. Brian's menacing smile would grow. You should be aware that father is all-knowing. We know about your son. Brian said. I have no children. Your twisted nature has clouded your minds if you truly believe that. Ray said, again, lying through his teeth. Well, it doesn't really matter if you want to admit it to me or not. The boy was born with a strong connection to the legacy, but with a weak heart, just like his father. Brian said as he laughed. Ray said nothing. Your attempt at hiding him away will not be enough to save him. We may not know where he is just yet, but I assure you, we will find him. None can escape our everlasting vision. Especially those who are weak. Race anger grew inside him. Well then, it's time to do what nature calls of us now. Time for the weak link in the bloodline to die, and the strong one to survive and prosper. The winds had picked up. The dark clouds above rotated, and the oceans began to stir up. Two brothers, who once trained together, who once did everything together, were now set to destroy each other. Brian drew his blade, a blade that has been used to slaughter countless innocents, stained in red. Ray drew his own, this one clean, shiny, and blue as the diamonds were when he mined them. The long silence finally broke when Ray let out a yell of anger and ran towards his brother. Ah! A clash of blades and legacy power showcased in the light of day that would go on until the dimness of sunset. Both fighters showed incredible display of power over their abilities, Brian chucking balls of fire like they were mere baseballs, Ray ripping rock and stone right out of the ground below and hurling them. Ray tried many times to seal Brian away to the nether by opening a portal with his hands, but Brian was prepared for this kind of offensive 
and always had an object to throw inside the portal to close it. Surely father taught you more than this, Brian said mockingly. I've learned enough, Ray replied, as he shot currents of water from the nearby ocean at his opponent, who was unfazed by it. While you are running like a coward for all these years, I've been training. While you got weaker and softer, I got stronger. I have become more powerful than you can possibly imagine, Ray. You are doomed to die here. Brian would say as they locked blades. Ray was a powerful legacy holder, but it was true. While he was running, he knew Andrew trained Brian harder and harder every day. Ray was going all out in this battle, not holding back one bit. Brian, on the other hand, was just toying with his opponent. With just one finger, Brian summoned mammoth-sized infernos, designed to swallow Ray whole. With just a single thought of mind, Brian ripped entire mine shafts right out of the caves they rested in and threw them in all directions. Ray struggled to keep up with his insanely powerful foe. While the unbelievable display of power that Brian had was terrifying, what horrified Ray the most was that there was still one out there even more powerful. The fact that Brian still kneeled down and called someone master. If this isn't even the fullest display of raw power that existed in the now corrupted legacy, or even in Brian himself, then how can there be hope for balance being restored? Brian, having the time of his life, continued ripping apart the lands around him and using it as ammo to throw. Ray was barely dodging each attack, taking small hits every time, but every small hit added up. They drew blades once again, as Brian, filled with rage for his brother's betrayal, slashed at Ray. We could have done so much together, but you let weakness take you. Now look at you, just as weak as these people that litter our world. Brian screamed. Brian slashed again, landing a devastating blow on Ray's eye. Blood dripped down from his face as he scrambled to get some distance. Ray had to do something quickly, before Brian lands a fatal blow. He knew he wasn't strong enough to kill Brian, so he had to temporarily subdue him. But how? Their long battle had traveled far across the lands, leaving destruction wherever they went. They now found themselves approaching a large ravine, filled with boiling lava. This was his chance. Ray directed Brian closer to the ravine, and threw a gust of wind in Brian's direction, pushing him away for a brief time. All the time Ray needed to control the lava. Ray reached deep within the planet and summoned as much hot lava as he possibly could with the little time he had. When Brian got close enough, Ray pushed all the lava up to the surface. The ground cracked and shook as the lava made its way up as a great wall of fire separated the two brothers. Ray then ran as fast as his superhuman legs could go away from the scene, as the barrier of fire and lava finally sunk back into the ground. Brian looked in all directions for his fleeing brother. He was nowhere in sight. He has escaped. Brian stared off into the distance. Father will not be pleased, Brian said, in fear of what Andrew would do to him as a result of his failure. Ray would eventually reunite with Amy. Upon first sight of her lover, she gasped. A large wound could be seen on Ray's eye. As soon as Ray found his way into Amy's arm, he collapsed onto the ground. Amy runs off and finds a village to take Ray to for medical attention. The wound would never fully heal, and he would lose partial sight in that eye. The mark would forever be a part of him, as a physical and mental scar. Ray knew that Brian was going to be a tough opponent to defeat, but he never imagined he'd become this strong. His son will never know of his abilities, so this means Ray is the last chance the world has, but this last hope has given up. Faith Fulfilled, Book 1, Mike's Legacy, Chapter 4, Miners Below. The monsters of the night are about to meet their doom.
at the merciless glare of the morning sunrise. Skeleton bones crackled, rotten zombie flesh cooked, and the moon finally set. Now the morning, with most assaulters either burned or fleeing, the two men awoke from their slumber. Mike, a voice said mockingly. Michael, get up, lazy bones. Oh, Clyde, would you knock it off? But Mike, you're the one who wanted me to wake you up this early. Uh, fine, fine, I'm awake, Mike said. As he slowly got out of bed, he let out a long yawn, stretched his sore muscles, letting out quiet grunts as he did so. I told you not to go after five creepers at once, but you just didn't listen to me. Yeah, yeah, you said the same thing last night. But you'd still do it again, wouldn't you? You bet I would! Guess I shouldn't be surprised. Clyde went to their storage chest and looked through various items inside. Then he pulled out a crumpled map, the one they used countless times to navigate around the world. Today's the day we tackle that cave. Oh yeah, that's right. Sorry for being grumpy. I remember now why I needed to be up so early. Well, let's not waste any more time than we need to. Eat up, and get what you need for the trip. Gotcha. Michael cooked a few of the remaining fish he had caught the previous afternoon to fuel him for his upcoming mining trip. Don't you ever get sick of eating just fish every day? Clyde asked, as he slipped his iron armor on. Clyde, if it's either eat the same thing every day, or die, I think the choice is obvious. Yeah, I mean, we could look for other things to hunt. Nah. I'd rather spend my time hunting monsters than defenseless animals. Whatever you say. They finished their morning grub and get what they needed. Pickaxes, shovels, torches, lots of torches, a supply of food, armor on their bodies, and swords in their hands. Oh, and they cannot forget their map. As the morning sun continued to rise over the horizon, the two warriors left their home and made their way to the north, towards the cave. They found themselves at the edge of where two biomes met. A tree-filled flatlands and an empty desert. You think there are any temples in that desert? Clyde asked with interest. I don't know, but I would love to find out. First, though, we need to explore this cave for diamonds. So, the score right now is... tied at 28, right? No, Clyde. It's 28 to 26. I'm leading you by two. Mike said with slight annoyance. Well then, if I find a patch of three diamonds, I'll be taking the lead. We'll see about that. You're on. Well then, may the best miner win. Michael and Clyde always competed to see which one could find the most diamonds by the end of the week. The current week was about to reach its end, so this mining trip would most likely decide the winner of the week. Traveling down the dark halls of the cave, Michael searched and searched for the precious blue gems. He saw plenty of iron and coal and a few patches of lapis but no precious diamonds were revealed. Yes, more gold, Mike said, as he drew his iron pickaxe and lined every last piece up. Unlike Clyde, Michael never passes up gold ore. He uses it to create golden apples, which are specialized apples that can heal certain wounds when eaten. It's one of his many ways of staying durable during battle. Around the corner lie a decent pool of lava, but, just across from reach lay four shiny blue diamonds. He just couldn't reach them. Gah! I knew I was forgetting something! I forgot to bring blocks to place! Mike thought to himself. He began to break the stone blocks around him and collected its cobble, starting to create a small path to cross the lava pool. About halfway through the lava path, the sound of bones clanking together echoes through the cave. Oh no. Mike mutters to himself and draws his sword and quickly turns around. Slowly emerging from the shadows of the caverns, a skeleton glows in the light of the lava. Drawing its bow, its arrow flies toward Mike, who quickly dodges it and watches the arrow soar into the lava and melting away. Running down the small cobble path, Mike reels his sword back and slashes at the skeleton. Tumbling down to the ground, the bone rattles to the floor behind him. Well, that was a close one, wasn't it? Swiftly, he turns around back to the lava and continues to place his cobble blocks till he reaches the other side. Once he cleared the surrounding area, he started to mine each diamond ore and adding it all up in his inventory. By the time he had finished, 
the vein of diamonds he had collected six diamond ore. Ha! Let's see Clyde beat that! Mike thought to himself. Making sure there aren't any more veins of ore in the area, he went back down to the cobblestone path of his own design. Caves are naturally dark, meaning that monsters shelter here during the day, and even sometimes at night. Hearing the sound of zombies groaning should be an expected sound. However, this was different. It was as if there was... a small army of them. A dungeon? He thought. No, it couldn't be. Naturally, he followed the sound and started seeing traces of mossy cobblestone. Soon, a small glow was emitting, and because of the small light, Mike could see the green, shriveled up faces of the undead. And he wasn't the only one to notice the other, and soon all of the green molded faces turned towards him. A handful among them were elite. Those that were drew their old rusty iron swords. About time I got a real challenge. I've had enough of these skeletons who were too afraid to fight me face to face, Mike said out loud. Drawing his sword, he grounds himself and then launches himself out at the closest elite. Locking blades with one another, Mike shows a confident smile as he swiftly moves to the left. With undead legs that were incapable of moving at high speeds, the zombie was unable to move out of the way fast enough. Cut at the knees, the elite falls to the ground. Trouble getting up? With one swift strike, he decapitates three regular zombies who fall to the floor with their elite comrade. Slowly, more and more of the undead start to surround Mike. He quickly takes his blade and spins in a quick circle, and all of the undead surrounding him fall to the floor. Stop hogging all the fun for yourself, will ya? A voice calls out in the distance. About time you showed up! What were you doing? Taking a nap with the creeper? Hey, that was one time, and it wasn't even my fault. Yeah, yeah, keep your head in the here and now. As Clyde comes into the cave further and fights his way toward Mike until they are back to back fighting off the horde. So how we doing? Same as always. That bad, huh? Clyde smirked. Mike brings his sword up and knocks down another zombie coming up next to Clyde. Watch your six instead of trying to antagonize me. Mike sarcastically states back before going back to fighting his side of the horde. The fighting seemed to go on for hours, and Mike and Clyde held their own. But the horde just seemed to keep growing. Oh, for Notch's sake, I forgot we have to target the spawner, Clyde said, feeling stupid. Taking down another zombie, he starts to go toward the spawner, not being able to notice the elite sneaking up after him. Clyde, watch out! Mike yells. Clyde turns around and screams, and falls back as he sees a blade aimed at his face. Mike hurls his sword at the zombie, hovering over his best friend, and watches him fall over to the side. He runs up to his friend, punching a few zombies out of the way. Thanks, Mike. Clyde says sheepishly. So that's how many times I've saved your skin now? Just shut up and help me up. Reaching down, Mike pulls Clyde up to a standing position. You get the spawner and I'll cover you. Mike says, picking up his sword again. Got it. Clyde runs back toward the glowing cage, and starts to hack away at it with his iron pickaxe. The cage breaks into several hundreds of bits onto the floor. The two warriors successfully finish off the remainder of zombies in the room. Clyde, grasping for breath, out of shock, says, Next time we run into a situation like that, can we not bigger? Sorry, bud. You started it. Whatever. Now let's see what reward we get for all that trouble. Clyde walks over to one of the two chests in the dungeon and opens it with excitement. You gotta be kidding me. What? Did you find another chest filled with string? Worse. Saddles. Oh, fun! And we never even use horses! Clyde slowly walks over to the second and final chest. For the record, if I find diamonds in this next chest, they count to my score. Hey, now wait a minute! Oh wait, you don't get diamonds in dungeons, do you? Oh yeah, you're right. If there's iron in there, take it. We can use it to repair our armor. Right. Opening the second chest, Clyde pulls out two bars of iron, three strings, and an empty bucket. Great, this dungeon was a waste. Clyde mutters, slamming the chest shut. Oh, come now, Clyde. Every iron ingot counts. 
You sound like a wise old man living alone in the plains. No, it's just unlike you, I look for the positivity in certain things. Plus, who doesn't like slashing zombies' heads off? Me. You aren't fooling anyone. You love knocking down zombies just as much as I do. Mike replied. So anyway, what's your final score for today, huh? Clyde asked with anticipation. What's yours? Not fair, I asked first. Fine. I got six. Funny. Cause you can't watch your six. Three. Sorry, what? I got three. I'm not sure I caught what you said. You know what I said, you blockhead. Whoa! You kiss your mother with that mouth? Anyways, that makes the final score for the week... Uh... 34 to 29. Looks like I win. Whatever. I'll win next week. Clyde says, wiping off some dirt that had gotten on his face. Let's head on home. Starting back out of the cave, with Clyde closely behind. Oh, come now. Are you serious? Three bloody emeralds for a stupid leather chest plate. You people are scammers, you know that. Clyde yelled at the villager. The villager just stared blankly at him. Ah, uh, give him a break. Big nose folk gotta stick together. Shut up. I told you my nose isn't that big. Whatever helps you sleep at night. Mike jokes and continues to walk around the village, leaving Clyde to try and bargain for a leather chest plate. Hey, didn't see you in town the other day. Off on another adventure? I guess you could say it was an adventure. I had to save Clyde's wretched behind again, though. Mike says, turning to the voice. He turns to see Isabella sitting on cobble steps, wearing her traditional flower crown and oversized sweater. She seems to never run out of flower crowns and sweaters. That makes 37 times, right? Nope. 40. Isabella lets out a small giggle. You guys are both always getting into trouble. It's honestly part of our lifestyle at this point. At least it's always changing. My lifestyle is always the same old, same old. You could always join us. No, no, I couldn't. Those disgusting things coming at me all the time? No, thank you. Plus, I wouldn't want to become a second Clyde for you to save. I heard that. Clyde yells, marching over with a leather chest plate on. How much you get that for? I'll have you know, I got it for two emeralds and four gold bars. So, you spent everything on a leather chest plate? No. Still got a few iron ingots left. <sighs> You're hopeless. So what did you guys do on this last adventure? Isabella asks, leaning forward in interest. Well, I found a couple of diamonds. <laughs> More than Clyde did. Hey! Clyde yells in protest, but Mike ignores him and continues. And then we found this horde of zombies coming from a spawner. No way! A real spawner? I thought those were supposed to be super rare. That's what I thought. But as I went further into the cave, I followed the noise, and there was the mossy stone and everything. He fought a couple of zombies for a while, and then I swooped in and saved him from a zombie trying to attack him. Clyde says. Really? Cause Mike told me that he saved your skin. Again. Really Mike? You have to tell everyone now that you've saved me 37 times? 40! Great, now you guys are mocking me in sync. Clyde says. He then dramatically places his hand on his heart. The betrayal. He then jokingly falls to the floor, and the three of them fall into a pit of laughter. What's going on over here? Two guys with a pretty lady? Are these boys bothering you, miss? Cause if they are, I can help take you away. Now buzz off, Lucas. We were actually having fun. No one was talking to you, Clyde. And no one wanted you here, Lucas. The two brothers growl at each other and glare. Now, now, children. No need to bicker. Mommy has enough bottle for the both of you. Shut, Shut it, it Mike. Mike! They both yell at the same time, causing both of them to go beet red in embarrassment, and Isabella and Mike let out bursts of laughter. Oh no, it's almost dinner time. I'll see you guys later. Bye, Mike. Bye, Clyde. Isabella waves back as she walks back to her house. What, no kiss goodbye? Lucas calls back. Bye, Lucas. Isabella says, rolling her eyes. Yes, I gotta buy! 
Lucas cheers. She's not into you, Lucas. Give it up. You're also five years older than her, so it's really creepy. Clyde says. To be fair, Clyde, we're all adults, so that doesn't really matter. I mean, I don't support of him getting all like that, but I'm just saying for reference. He acts like a lonely 16-year-old. Oh, you're gonna get it! Lucas yells, and Clyde and him run off into town. Not the face, not the face! Clyde yells, running down the streets. Mike lets out a small chuckle and a breath he didn't even realize he was holding in. He stands near the edge of town and leans against the well and stares out at the setting sun. That feeling of depression that always seems to find him at times was tugging at him again. He couldn't explain why he feels this way. Was there something more out there for him? Some mystery yet to be uncovered? What purpose do I really serve here? He thought to himself. Michael has Clyde, Isabella, and Lucas at his side, but yet he still feels alone somehow. Like there's some force pushing his happiness away and replacing it with this sadness. Those two at it again? Asked a deep voice. Yep. Those two really are just like little kids at heart, aren't they? Mike says, looking out at them. And you aren't? Asked the villager. Maybe. Back in the day. You seem troubled. Yeah, Frank. It's that feeling again. I don't know where it comes from, but it always seems to find me. Mike said, with a loss of emotion. Isabella sees it in you, too. Frank says, with concern. Well, that girl can read me like a book, so I'm not in the slightest bit surprised. You really have nothing to be sad about, Mike. You have things that so many others would do anything to have. I know, but it just feels like there's something pulling me away from here. This feeling is telling me that I need to go on more adventures and just live life out there, you know? Listen to me, Michael. I know you want to venture out there into the world, but if you go out there, you will be killed by the legacy holders. They are merciless and will treat you like a speck of dust. I know, Frank. You've told me the stories all the time when I was a kid. They are not stories, Michael! Fine. Legends. Michael, I want you to take this seriously. Promise me you will never venture out into the world. Caves and camping trips are one thing, but promise me you won't leave. I promise. Good. Michael, I'm telling you, one day, someone just has to save us from those demons. Now come on, it's time to eat. Okay, I'll- Mike freezes and looks out into the distance. He could see the outline of a staggering figure that was limping toward the town. The figure seemed to be dragging a sword across the ground as it came closer and closer. Is it a zombie? An elite? No, it's still bright out. They would be burning. Then who could this be? These thoughts started rattling in Mike's mind. Like in slow motion, Mike watched as the figure came closer until suddenly it fell over, rolling onto the ground, still. He quickly ran over with Frank hot on his tail. When Mike finally reached the figure on the ground, he began to examine them. It was a human, or at least looked like one. They also looked female. She had matted brown hair that looked to be caked in dirt and leaves. Her shirt was completely ripped and covered in dirt, and her arms and legs seemed to be littered with scars. Don't just stand there! Help me get her to the town doctor! Frank yells, looping one of her arms over his shoulder, hoisting her body up. Snapping out of his daze, Mike quickly lurches forward and helps Frank bring the mystery girl to the town doctor. Unbeknownst to anyone, the second step of the Seeds of Hope's plantings was made. His savior had been found. Now in the town doctor's quarters, the mystery girl lay, unconscious and bleeding. Looks like she took quite the beating, the doctor said, after examining her wounds. That goes without saying. She'll be okay though, right doctor? I think if she gets the proper rest, she'll be just fine. Can you look after her for me? I have other patients I have to attend to from last night's zombie attack. Sure thing. You can count on me, Doc. 
Mike said as the doctor exited the room. <laughs> wasn't so long ago that I myself was in similar surroundings, in similar shape as her. Either she strayed too far from home, or she's just like me, craving adventure and excitement. I do hope it's the second one, Mike thought to himself. The girl's eyes began to open. As they did, she let out a long groan. Her eyes snapped open, realizing she wasn't in the place she remembered. Hey, hey, settle down. You're all right. She turned to face the voice that spoke to her. Where am I? You're in the medical facility of a small village. We saw you walking this way, but before you could make it, you collapsed on the ground. Myself and another helpful villager carried you here to be examined by the town doctor. Thank you for your kindness, but I need to head out now. She says, starting to get out of the bed and limping weakly toward the door. Whoa, whoa, wait a second, miss. I was instructed by the doctor to keep watch on you, so I'm afraid you can't leave just yet. Mike said as he blocked the exit. And why not? He said you need to have the proper rest if your injuries are going to properly heal. Trust me, I know how painful it is to try and keep fighting without letting my wounds heal. It's no fun. Mike said, continuing to block the doorway. The girl took a long look at Michael, up and down. You're an adventurer, aren't you? What? How did you know? You've just met me! I see it in your eyes. Those eyes of yours have seen many things. Well, you're not wrong. They certainly have. Mike said, almost with a bit of confidence. Michael, I don't know why you're leaning on my wooden door, but unless you want to push it out of the frame, I suggest you move aside so I can come in. A voice said from the outside. Oops, sorry, my bad. Mike said as he moved out of the way. The doctor entered the room and took a look around. She didn't damage anything, did she? Uh, no. I'm gonna have to ask you to lie down, miss. I would like to examine your wounds to see how well they've healed so far. You aren't putting your hands on me. The girl yelled in defense. Relax, miss. I know you're a bit ruffled at the moment, but this guy's a professional. You have my word. He will do you no harm. Michael said from the corner of the room. Slowly, the girl sits down on the bed and lets the doctor examine her arms and legs. So, do you have a name, or do I just keep calling you Miss? Mike breaks the silence in the room. The girl just stares head on, ignoring him. The doctor turns around to reach for more bandages, and that's when suddenly she is up and running towards the door. Wait! Stop! The doctor yells, trying to gain his balance from the sudden movements. Mike runs after her, and the two of them are out in the fields in less than a minute. The girl sprints fast, but in her condition, she couldn't outrun Mike. Knowing this, she heads towards the tree line. You aren't going to make it far in that condition! Mike yells, still running after her. Just come back before you get an infection! Mike follows after her into the trees and is having to dodge low branches and weave around trunks, but he makes sure not to lose sight of the injured mystery girl. Finally, the girl suddenly stops, and Mike slows down to a slow jog as the girl kneels down at a lake. <sighs> I thought you would never stop. Well, I can't run across water, so... <sighs> Slippery one you may be but not slippery enough for that. Now let's head back to the village. The sun is almost set and the monsters are gonna start coming out. Fine. Mike stands up and puts his hand out, but the girl ignores it and stands on her own and starts down the path that they just ran from. The sun rose on the small town. Creatures of the night fled and burned at the merciless glare of the sun. Man, I wish I could have gotten into some of that action. Mike thought to himself, the girl, still fast asleep, tossed and turned in the doctor's bed. Who's the babe? Said a voice from behind. Gah! What the heck, Lucas? When did you get here? Just now? You finally get yourself a girlfriend? Very funny. Me and Frank found her collapsed on the ground yesterday, so we took her in for her to heal. She's quite the smoke show, isn't she? Lucas said, 
staring at her sleeping form. Get out. Oh, come on, Michael. Get. Out. Not saying a word, Lucas left the room. It's a wonder how those two are related, Michael said, putting a hand to his forehead in disgust. Mike turned to look at the bed in which the girl laid, to find her sitting upright and staring directly at him. When did you wake up? I'd say right about when you yelled. Oh yeah, sorry about that. One of the nosy ones in town came in here and jump scared me. He sounded like one all right. How do you feel? Rested. That's good to hear. Were you here all night? Pretty much. I stayed over here, though, don't worry. Mike said, chuckling. Why? One motto I live by is no man, well, in this case, woman, gets left behind. The girl looked down to the floor for a few moments, then said, Destiny. I excuse me? You asked me yesterday what my name was. It's Destiny. Oh. Well, pleasure to meet you, Destiny. My name is Michael. But most folks just call me Mike. The two looked at each other for a while. Destiny would break the silence by saying, Did you get hurt yesterday too? What happened to your shoulder? She asked, looking at the mark on top of Mike's left shoulder. Huh? Oh no, I'm fine. That's just a scar. He said, pointing to it. What happened? She asked with concern. Long story short, I found one too many elite zombies that I could handle all at once. And one of them got a good blow on my shoulder, lost feeling in that entire arm for weeks. It was basically a noodle on my body, obviously, as you can see. I'm all good now, he explained as he twisted and turned the arm. Yes, thanks to my efforts, said another voice from behind. Da what the? What is with you people and sneaking up behind me today? Destiny let out a small giggle. So sorry, but I think I'm allowed to enter my own residence without knocking. Mike let out a small growl. So, while I ignore Michael's childish complaining, let me ask you, did you sleep well, miss? Yeah, I guess. Soon as we got back, she was out like a light. And soon, I'll be out of here faster than a light. Destiny said with determination. Why's that? You have somewhere you need to go? The girl paused, looking down at the floor again, but this time in thought. Did she really have anywhere to go? She never really gave that question any thought. She was always on the run. Not really, she said. Don't you have a family? No. A long silence followed this statement. The doctor had nothing to say. Michael had too much to say. He didn't know which response to say. Looks like we have something else in common, Mike said, breaking the silence. The two of them are now both looking down at the floor, or anywhere else but at each other. The doctor slowly slips out of the door, muttering something about needing more herbs. I might have my friends, who are almost like my family, but I never really knew my legitimate family. Mike said, looking at the ceiling. I guess we do have a thing in common. Destiny trails off. Suddenly she stands, causing Mike's attention to come down from the ceiling. But one thing we don't have in common is that I'm not staying here. Destiny says and starts toward the door only for Mike to stand in front of it once again. Step out of my way. I'm better and rested. Now move. Where are you going to go? You have no supplies, no weapons. You'll die the first night you're out there. There aren't many towns out there that'll help you, let alone exist. I might have just met you, but if I can keep you from going out there and dying, then I'm doing it. Then come with me. If you don't want me dead, then protect me from more than just a wooden door. I can't do that, Mike says. And why is that? You said it yourself. You have friends, but you have no family here. Nothing is holding you back but yourself. Destiny shouts. The room falls silent. Look, Mike, I'm sorry. Destiny starts, but Mike puts his hand up. Don't. You're right. I'm what? Destiny steps back in shock. You're right. I have no real family here but they've treated me like family. So I'm not just going to uproot myself from their lives and walk away from everything they've done for me. You say you can read my eyes, and I can read yours too. You've been alone, haven't you? No one out there who cares about you. Well, now you've found a place where people do. Mike says. You don't even know me. No, 
but I can't in good conscience allow you to get hurt. You're not my father. Michael's eyes widen at the mention of that word. His eyes, unblinking, shoot down to the ground. What's happening to him? Destiny asks, concerned. Looking up, his eyes meet hers. But he's just staring into space. Jaws dropped as low as they can possibly go. Rushing into the scene, Isabella shakes Michael's shoulder and says, Michael, snap out of it! It wasn't your fault! Michael snaps out of the trance, eyes blinking a million times a second to make up for the loss of blinking earlier. Putting his jaws back into place, he says, You know what? Fine. Just leave us behind. The ones who actually cared about you. Go on! Have fun in that empty world that the legacy holders are slowly ripping apart. Void of emotion, Michael turns and walks away from the scene, his face unmoving as he slowly walks out of town to his home. The scene fell silent again, with destiny filled with confusion and guilt, Isabella watching as he slowly walks up the hill, then turning to face destiny, red hot with anger. What just happened? Isabella let out a growl and said, If only you understood the magnitude of the mental anguish you just reminded him of. What? All he wanted to do was help you. Isabella took one last glare at Destiny, then turned and ran in the direction Mike had left from. Destiny stood alone to dwell on what had just happened. Isabella would walk into Michael and Clyde's house to find Michael banging away at his anvil, repairing his iron chest plate. The clangs of metal could be heard before she even walked in. His eyes fixed on the task at hand, but the clangs he put forth were fueled by rage. It wasn't your fault at all, Isabella said as he clanged away. Michael ceased his repetitive motions, took a long breath, and said, You weren't there. You don't know. But I know what went down. You can't even begin to understand! If I hadn't have taken him with me, he'd still be with us now! He wanted to go with you. He wanted to do everything with you. I could have told him to stay behind. I could have had him stay safe until the morning. I could have saved him. But instead, I got him killed. Michael would say as his bloodshot eyes would begin to water. Mike. Just go. I need some time for myself. But... Please, just go. She wanted to comfort him so bad, but she just did as he wished and left him behind. It was as he said he wanted, but he really did want to be comforted. However, in his eyes, it isn't the warrior way to show weakness. The moon rose over the darkened world. A figure, dressed in black, enters a hidden castle. The figure walked through the halls and into a small room, where a middle-aged man was waiting. Have you located him? The man asked. The hooded figure kneeled on their knees and said, Yes, master. The figure removed its hood to reveal a young woman, showing physical signs of being overworked and exhausted. Very good, Ebony. I will report this to my father at once. Brian. Oh, excuse me. I mean, master, when will I be allowed to put this sad dog out of his misery? That will be unnecessary, Ebony. To have him be broken inside is just what father wanted. Brian said as a grin appeared on his face. I understand, master. Hunt down this new enemy and bring him to me alive. As for his companions, if they will not serve our purpose, eliminate them along with any surviving villagers who had helped them. This is my father's command. And so it will be done. Clyde grunts as he collapses to the ground. He finds a stick pointing to his neck. Your form is still sloppy. Let's try this again. Mike said. Clyde got up to his feet and grabbed his wooden stick. Remember, precise and elegant swipes. Mike instructed, waving his fake sword above Clyde to signify his battle stance. Clyde nodded and proceeded to do the same stance. Michael attacked first, swiping the stick towards Clyde's legs. He blocks it and aims for Michael's face. Michael dodges and attacks with ease. Someone's ambitious today, Mike teased. I don't know why you still train me. 
The only enemies we face who still hold swords are elite zombies. They're too inexperienced to do us any damage. Even still, I can't stand to see you perform so poorly as you did in the dungeon when I had to save your skin again. Mike said as he swung around and went for Clyde's arm. Clyde barely blocked the attack in time. Never get distracted in battle, Mike said. The two men continued their practice duel. Using his surroundings to his advantage, Clyde jumped up into the trees and hid himself among the leaves. Michael stood motionless, trying to listen for Clyde's movements. Clyde carefully maneuvered himself through the leaves, trying to get a good angle on where to strike from. Once he had it, he jumped down, letting gravity carry him to his opponent. Clyde swung around and went for Michael's neck and made contact. Got ya. And I got you, Mike said, as Clyde noticed a stick jabbing into his stomach. Ugh, tied again? There's no such thing as a tie in a duel of blades. You win, you survive. You lose, you die. Clyde let out a sigh. You're getting better. At least you don't scream every time you charge anymore. Yeah, after the run-in with that army of creepers, I think I'll save the battle cries for deaf opponents. Well, I think that should do for training today. Shall we head to the village to get a bite to eat? I thought you were going to make fish stew. I was, but somebody ate all our fish. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Sorry about that. They made their way down to Isabella's village with empty stomachs, bickering with one another the whole way down. Farther away from the village lay a stronghold, underneath the planet's surface, home to two warriors clouded in dark energy. Twins from birth, yet separated by one heart that is pure, and the other conflicted. You're back, said a shy voice. Kyle, we have work to do, said Ebony as she walked in through the doors. What has he asked of us this time? The sun has been found. He wants us to find him, destroy his friends, and bring him to the castle. Ebony explained to her brother. Is he the legacy holder? Yes, but he doesn't even know it himself, so he has no abilities to use. However, he is extremely talented with the blade, so I will need your help to take him down. Oh, okay. Get your robes and whatever you'll need. It's going to be a long trip. Back at the village, the two miners were still bickering with one another or who had the best performance on the previous hunt. Are you seriously still trying to debate this? Yes, you know just as well as I that I had more than you. Hmm, not from what I saw in the difference of bones in our respective chests. You stole some from me, you blockhead. Easy with the profanity, Frank said, carving his stick. Honestly, you two are like children. Isabella said from the opposite end of the table. Does that make you our mom? Clyde, no. Isabella and Frank simultaneously facepalm. So what new resources did you dig up from that dusty old mine shaft? We got some melon seeds, so now we'll finally be able to make a melon farm. Yeah, great. You'll get to spit seeds at me again. It's getting late, you two. You'd better head on home, unless you want to miss all the fun. Oh yeah. You heard the man, Clyde. Let's get going. Mike said, getting up off his seat. The duo bid their goodbyes to their friends and left for home just before the sunset. As they walked up the hill leading to their homes, a figure hooded in black was patiently watching. Go. Whispered a female voice in the distance, unheard by Mike or Clyde. And remember, leave the legacy holder alive. Kill the others, said a quiet male voice, also unheard. As the sun finally set below the horizon, noises of movement could be heard among the grass and trees. Michael put his hand in front of Clyde and said, We're not alone. What do you mean? What do you think I mean? There's someone here watching us! The sounds of movement continued, but they seemed to be coming from every direction. Coming from trees, the grass, and even from the small nearby lakes and rivers. The moon rose into the sky as the two miners found themselves surrounded. But by who, or what, after what seemed like an eternity, a neat line of zombies, with a decent amount of them being elite, jumped down from the trees, swam out of the lakes, and rose from the ground. They all faced toward their opponents. Michael's eyes widened, but not with fear, with surprise. Clyde, however, was indeed afraid. He hadn't seen this many zombies unionized into one horde in a very long time. In moments, 
Zombies circled around the two miners, surrounding them. Clyde drew his bow, knowing he could be more effective with it instead of his sword. Michael drew out both of his blades, prepared to take on this large horde. The two assassins looked on from a distance to see if their forces could be enough to do their master's bidding. Shouldn't we be helping them? Why? They're just zombies. They're expandable. Besides, we must let them weaken them first. Then we strike. Ebony said with a wicked smile. Kyle said nothing in response and looked back at the scene. Clyde took on an arrow and pulled back on the bow, aiming at his first target. Michael lunged forward toward the mob, cutting down seven zombies with one swipe. The first elite took charge, aiming at Michael, but with non-lethal targets. Mike blocked every swipe, cut and slashed his way through. Clyde continued to shoot, floored four zombies with four consecutive shots. Clyde noticed something about how Michael was fighting. He's been noticing this for a while now. His strikes are precise, yes, but not like they usually are. His strikes are fueled by anger and pain. His confident smile faded into an angry frown. But he had no time to think about that, as the zombie was getting too close. He shot it down with one quick arrow. The once large horde was being reduced, zombie by zombie. The elite zombies being taken out in large quantities by Michael's precise slices. Kyle, go after the legacy holder. Kyle looked back at his sister with a face of fear. Quit your whining. He hasn't discovered his powers yet, remember? So just go! Kyle went over slowly to the scene of the fight, drawing his iron blade, which unlike his sister's, stained in innocent blood. This was clean. He walked among the decreasing crowd of zombies for camouflage. Waiting for the right moment, he continued maneuvering among the crowd. Using anger as his fuel, Mike continued to slash at his foes. The two miners were getting separated, which was just what the zombies were instructed to do. Kyle drew in closer and closer. When most of the elite zombies were defeated and Clyde was far enough away, Kyle made his final move forward. Believing victory was in here, Michael began exhausting most of his energy with powerful strikes. A call could be heard in the distance, and the remaining zombies stopped their assault. They moved aside to reveal Kyle standing in the center of the circle, staring at Michael with emotionless eyes. Michael was surprised to see this man standing among monsters without being attacked. Without saying a word, Kyle lunged forward at Michael, attempting to disarm him. Mike jumped out of the way to dodge the attack. Mike, expecting a slow attack, took his time to look behind him, something that would nearly cost him an arm, as he witnessed a blade about to hit. Moving his opposite blade to block, he looks on in shock. He hasn't faced a human in such a long time. As most of the remainder of the human race was hiding out, Kyle was not like the elite zombies. Elite zombies are given a small amount of training by Brian, but just enough to have basic understanding of how to duel. Something that wouldn't help with an advanced duelist like Michael or Clyde. However, Kyle and Ebony were personally trained by Brian privately. They each learned their skills far beyond just the basics. Continuing to lock blades, they made their way to the village below. Clyde, finishing off what was left of the zombies, ran ahead of them to try and warn the villagers below of what was coming. Michael was pushing the young Kyle back with his powerful strikes. Step after step, strike after strike, the two of them went at it for what seemed like hours. Ebony, tired of her brother's failing, jumped from her spot of hiding and drew her blood-stained iron sword. She slowly starts walking over. Clyde bursts into the town and runs down the street shouting for help. Help! There's someone attacking Mike! There are other people and they're attacking Mike! Isabella wakes up from sudden outbursts and goes to her door as she is rubbing the sleep from her eyes. What's happening? Clyde, are you okay? Mike and I were headed home. We were surrounded by a huge horde of zombies. And then when the horde started to shrink, this guy jumped from the trees and attacked Mike. Clyde bursts out while also catching his breath. That was the fastest I ever ran in my whole life. Well, catch your breath quickly. We gotta go help him. Isabella says, grabbing her father's sword and putting on her shoes. You're gonna go in your PJs? Save your clever remarks for later. Oh, so they're clever. Clyde! As the two of them start their sprint out of the village, both Mike and Kyle start to slow down their fighting. Who are you? Mike yells as he blocks another strike. Kyle ignores him and aims a swipe at Mike's legs. Quickly dodging it, Mike tries to hit the hilt of Kyle's blade to knock it out of his hand. Why are you attacking me? Mike tries to question again. Kyle goes for a strike at Mike's arm, but is blocked again. 
This time when Mike goes for Kyle's hilt, it flies out of his hand and onto the ground. Mike then reaches forward and shoves Kyle to the ground. Answer me! Why are you attacking us? Mike yelled, putting the blade close to his face. Kyle stares up at him. His face showed anger, but Mike could see the terror and conflict in his eyes. As Mike was distracted, Ebony starts to raise her sword to attack him. In his side vision, he saw it, but before he could react, an arrow zips in front of his face and into Ebony's shoulder. She lets out a shout of agony and stumbles back. Mike turns to see Clyde with a bow and another arrow in its notch, ready to fire, and Isabella standing with a sword. Ebony lets out a growl. Your little village isn't going to stay standing for long. And next time, we'll be ready. Ebony spits out before swiftly turning around with the arrow still lodged in her shoulder. Mike turns to Kyle as he starts to scramble to his feet and run after the other girl like a lost dog stuck on a leash. Clyde and Isabella run up next to Mike as the three of them watch the two mystery people disappear into the forest. Why didn't you kill the guy? We should go after them. That way they won't have a chance to strike back. No. Mike says as he put away his swords. Why no? What do you mean no? There's something off about those two. Well duh, they tried to kill you! In my book, everyone deserves a second chance. Let's just head back. Mike says, turning to go back toward the village. Michael, wait. And Mike turns to look at him, ready for Clyde to yell more about the two figures. It's forty to one now. Clyde says, putting his arrows away and giving Mike a cheeky smile. Mike shakes his head, and the three of them head back to the village. How can you say someone who tried to murder you deserves a second chance? See, that's the thing. He wasn't trying to murder me. I think attacking you with a sword counts as attempted murder. But I could tell he didn't want to hurt me. Maybe it was just his personality, or they wanted me alive. How can you act so calm? There are people that want to capture you! Because they didn't. That makes no sense! It's just how he works, Isabella. Clyde says, rolling his eyes. Most things that are evil don't start out that way. And they don't have to end that way. Mike says, like a wise old man. As the two assassins ran, many thoughts circled in their mind about what had just happened. What's going to happen now? We report back to our master about our failure. Is he gonna kill us this time? Kyle asked to the point of tears. Doubt it. As long as we remain useful to him, he won't toss us aside. The assassin duo headed for their master's castle. As they approached, they noticed a large plume of thick black smoke rising above the entire structure. Kyle began to motion towards the building, but Ebony stopped him in his tracks. The Lord of the Earth has come before us. Ebony said as she stared into the smoke above. Inside the castle, Brian bowed before the source of smoke. The smoke manipulated itself to look like a man, but it was just the shape of a man. The shape was faceless, lifeless, and immortal. The only thing resembling a facial feature were the two shiny red dots where eye sockets should be. Without a mouth to speak with, it still managed to say, Have you dispatched the assassins to deal with the boy? As you instructed. Have they managed to complete their mission? As you predicted, no. They were defeated by Michael, with help from his friends. Brian replied, still bowing before the thick black smoke. The smoky figure spread its heat across the entire castle. While the smoke itself was hot, most of the heat coming from this figure was from all the raw power it had inside. The castle shook from all the power it was throwing in every direction. I have a change of plans for you. Brian said nothing, and continued to kneel. Continue to send your pawns out to face him. However, only pick off his friends one by one. This way, we can slowly bring out the monster within. As soon as his inner monster is released, he will be one of us. Brian looked up to the heated smoke and said, As you wish. Father. Faith Fulfilled, Book One, Mike's Legacy, Chapter Eight. Destiny wandered through the empty forests, still with guilt clogging her heart. She knew only of one person that she could trust, to guide her in the right decision. A wise man, who seemed to always have the answers. As she walked towards her destination, she continued to think about what had happened a few days prior. What did I do to upset him so much? All I said was he wasn't my father. She thought to herself. 
She was thinking so deeply that she almost walked straight into a ravine. After putting her fist toward the ravine, she kept on moving. After an hour of walking, she finally reached her journey's end. A small home, but still big enough to hold multiple people. She walked to the door and made a couple of soft knocks. A few seconds following, a middle-aged man came to the door and said, Ah, Destiny. Good to see you again. Come in. The man stepped aside and walked Destiny in. Also inside the home was a lady who seemed to be around the same age. She gave Destiny a smile as she walked in. You seem troubled. Please sit, the man said. Pulling a chair, Destiny sat down and put her hands on her forehead, showing visible stress. Talk to me. What's wrong? The man asked. I got ambushed by a lot of monsters in the middle of the night. I was wounded very badly. So bad, in fact, that I blacked out. Before I did, though, I was walking towards a village. I passed out before I could make it. Oh, my. I woke up in a medical building. One of the villagers and another man carried me there. Did they try to rob you? No. That was what was surprising. Usually that's what I expect when I find other people. But this man who brought me there, he stayed with me the whole time. I thought it was because he was just a pig who had the hots for me. No. I just wanted to make sure I was alright. The man began showing signs of concern. T tell me, Destiny. What did this man look like? He asked nervously. Huh? Oh, he had light brown hair, blue eyes, tan skin, and iron armor on. Did he know how to use a sword? Yes, actually. I saw him fight a couple of times, and he was spectacular with the blade. What was his name? The man asked, now starting to shake with anxiousness. Mike. His name was Mike. Looking up at the man, the man looked down to the floor, then over to his wife who was listening to the conversation. As they locked eyes on one another, they each showed widened eyes. The stare lasted for what seemed like an eternity. Is something wrong? Destiny asked, as the middle-aged couple continued to look at each other. No, nothing at all. So, so, what did this Mike fellow do to make you so visibly upset? The man asked, looking back at Destiny. Nothing. It's actually what I did to him. The man raised an eyebrow. He tried so hard to make sure I was alright. He never left my side, even when I showed no gratitude. He even tried to run out of the village from the doctor's bed. He came after me and brought me back when I had nowhere else to run. I asked him why he cared so much, and he said that he couldn't in good conscience allow me to get hurt. I then yelled at him, saying he wasn't my father. After I said that, he went into what looked like a trance. I saw a lot of depression in his eyes when he snapped out of it. His friends then yelled at me, and he went off on his own. So, you saying he isn't your father upset him? Yes, but I don't understand why that would be. I was such a jerk to everyone there. And all they wanted was to help me. Do you remember where this village is? Uh, yeah. Why? The man stood up from his chair and said, Take me there. I'd like to meet this Mike fellow. Wait, what? He didn't do anything wrong. Don't go hurt him. Settle down, I'm not. I just want to meet him. That's all. Oh. Um, okay then, I suppose. Destiny rose from her chair. The two made their way to the door. Oh, and Ray? Yes, Destiny? When will we continue our training? If this Michael fellow is as good at the blade as you say, the next time we train, you will have a training partner. Ray said as he opened the front door. Amy stayed behind to guard the home from the hordes that night. Seriously? Gravel and emeralds for flint? You get flint from gravel! Clyde yelled at the villagers. The villagers said nothing and continued to stare at him with his emerald green eyes. Oh, pipe down, Clyde. There are some people out there stupid enough to take that deal, I'm sure. Mike joked, putting his hand on Clyde's shoulder. Oh, I bet. Come on now, Clyde, don't be so sour. It's not my fault that you suck at strip mining. Would you shut up about that already? You won this week. You won this week. You won this week. Do I have to say it more? Eh, maybe a couple more times. Quit being a jerk, Mike. Isabella said, walking toward the two men. <laughs> if I can't have a little fun, I might as well leave. Our definitions of fun are quite different. Quite. Your version of fun is rooting wheat and potatoes all day. Very funny. All right, all right, I'll lay off. I don't need you whacking me over the head with an iron shovel again. You better. Anyways, moving on from Micah's childness, I have some iron I'd like to trade. Is your blacksmith around? Clyde asked, 
waving the iron bars in the air. I believe so. Let me go get him, Isabella said, walking toward the blacksmith's house with Clyde following behind. As Isabella walked away, Frank came out of his house and walked towards Mike. Seems like you're doing better. You could say that. Well, look who's decided to come back, Frank said, looking off in the distance. Mike looked in the same direction, watching two figures coming their way. Let's hope they're here to trade. I don't think so, Frank. Ray and Destiny entered the village. Ray began looking around in amazement of seeing a village as functional as this one still existing. Is he here? Ray whispered to Destiny. Yes, that's him over there, talking to the villager in green robes. As she motioned to Mike and Frank, they slowly walked over to Mike. Ray was overwhelmed with her emotion as he took each step. Uh, are you okay, mister? Mike asked as he looked up at the man. Ray looked down upon Mike with widened eyes. Was this him? Was this the boy he had left behind all those years ago? Hello there. My name is Ray. Ray said nervously. Pleasure to meet you, Ray. My name is Michael. Mike said with equal politeness. Ray's mind was flooded with various thoughts, and his heart was flooded with various emotions. Mike reached out a hand, gesturing a handshake. Ray slowly took out his quivering hand, and met with Mike's, and the two had a long handshake. This guy is kinda weird. Mike thought to himself. As they concluded their handshake, Destiny walked up beside Ray and looked at Mike. Oh. Well... Welcome back, Destiny. Look, Mike, I'm sorry for whatever I did that upset you. I hope you know I didn't mean to hurt you. Mike put up a hand and said, You don't need to apologize. I know you didn't mean any harm, but just be mindful, alright? Ray was impressed with the wise reaction that Mike had to the situation. This must be his son. The similar physical features and the similar wisdom and choice of words. There is no questioning it. This is THE Michael that he had left behind 19 years ago. Michael Campbell. You're forgiving me that easily? Why shouldn't I? Holding grudges is a waste of energy. He couldn't believe that this was actually happening. His son. Alive. But how could this be? Surely he would have been killed by the monsters of the night. The Legacy Holders minions, or even the Legacy Holders themselves. It's not like the villagers can fight to protect themselves, let alone a child. But no. He was here. Here right now. Right in front of him. His own flesh and blood. What would Amy say? Sure, she had suspicions after hearing his conversation with Destiny. But what would she say after having her suspicions confirmed? Ray would look to see two swords on Mike's back. Nice swords you've got there. Oh, thank you. I crafted them myself. They've been very useful and have saved my life and my friends' lives countless times. Mike said taking one of the blades off his back and looking at it. Sounds like you know how to properly use them. Indeed. On my early adventures, I searched through abandoned libraries and strongholds to learn the knowledge of sword fighting. That, and martial arts in general. He's an adventurer, too. He really is just like his father. Adventurous, wise, and strong. But has he discovered his legacy powers? Ray concluded that this was the time to find out. Would you like to spar with me? Ray said taking one of his own blades from his back. I beg your pardon? Spar with me. I want to see how good you are. Okay. Well, let's not do that with real swords. I have some training swords over at my place that I use to train my student. Let me go grab them. Mike said as he turned and ran up the hill. A student? Ray thought to himself. So, you finally came back, said Frank, who had remained silent, watching the conversation go on. Ray looked over at the villager with confusion. You came back to find your boy. Haven't you? I don't know what you're talking about. You should know. He's been wondering where you've been all his life. If he had done something wrong to make you want to leave him behind. If there was something wrong with him. You've no idea how much pain you have caused him. Every day he thinks about you, wondering where you are. You have a lot of nerve showing up here again. I had my reasons. You couldn't possibly understand. Ray said. As he looked into the distance, Destiny just looked on at the conflict brewing in front of her. You're right. I don't understand, Frank said as he walked away. Destiny watched the villager walk into his home, then looked back at Ray. What was that all about? Nothing. Don't worry about it. He saw Mike returning down the hill, with four wooden training swords. All right, let's do this, Mike said, tossing two of the wooden sticks to Ray. Hold up. Not here. Let's do this somewhere with more space. You're right. Let's go to the outskirts of the village. The two walked out of the village with Destiny following behind. When they felt there was enough space, they took their opposite positions. 
They each raised their blades over their heads to signify their battle stances, which were the same. Like father, like son. Mike made the first move, swiftly spinning and turning as he made his way toward his opponent. He took a shot at the face, where he blocked, barely even moving his arms. Mike's eyes widened, then he took another quick shot, this time at the stomach. Once again, barely moving, Ray blocked. Now it was time for Ray to attack. In a flash, Ray took several swings in multiple places on Mike's body. Mike barely blocked them all in time. Ray then kicked Michael to the ground with a swift blow to the chest. With a grunt, he hit the ground. Looking up, Mike saw Ray flying toward him. Mike rolled on the ground to avoid being hit by another swipe of the sword. Ray was moving with inhuman speeds, but not the speeds that would make him seem like the legacy holder he is. Swiping at Michael in every spot imaginable. Mike was blocking some of the attacks, but not all of them. Cuts and bruises appeared on Mike's body. Mike tried to take the offense, but he was always forced to remain on the defensive, with the unbelievable speed and agility his opponent was displaying. Ray's wooden swords were beginning to crack under the immense strength he was pushing them through. Ray took one final swipe to Mike's face, which landed full on. He then kicked Mike forward with a powerful kick. Michael flew backward into a tree trunk. As he struggled to get up, he saw the wooden blade pointing at his face. Looks like I win. H how How can you possibly move that fast? I may look like an old man, but make no mistake, I can hold my own. You've got skill, Michael. There's no denying that. But you still have much to learn. Clyde, who was watching in the distance, began chuckling like a madman. <laughs> hey! Quit your laughing over there! I'm sorry, but this is priceless. Michael groaned as he got back to his feet. Maybe with a little bit more training, we can try again. Sounds like a plan. Guys, the sun is setting! Isabella yelled in the distance. Everybody looked up into the sky to see the sun almost completely set. So they went to their respective homes to spend the night. Ray left the village, unknown to anyone but him, that the final legacy holder had been found. Faith Fulfilled, Book One Chapter 9 A Broken Man I'm afraid Ray has found the boy, according to our spies, Brian said, bowing to his father. Just as I predicted. Has he begun training him? No. He is currently trying to recruit him. But I assure you, I can dispatch my pawns, and they can find him before Ray has a chance to train him. That will not be necessary. Ray is too weak to reveal to the boy of his origins. But he eventually will have to. And when he does, it will destroy the boy's spirit. Then I will be able to corrupt his soul, all of his power, all of his knowledge of the last remaining survivors, all of his skill with the blade. That will be intensified by his upcoming training. Will all be for us to control. As a matter of fact, send the pawns. If Michael can't handle those two, then he isn't worth being in our service. As you wish, father. The smoke faded into the air, and with it the tremendous heat that emitted from it. Brian rose from his knees and watched as the doors of the room opened. Ebony walked in. What are the orders from our master? Clyde began giggling every time Michael walked by. For not just sake, Clyde! The fight happened days ago! Stop laughing at me! Does it- It's just so funny. <laughs> it's really not. Mike said, rolling his eyes. Clyde continued laughing on. Clyde, give me a break. Need I remind you what day is coming up? Clyde's laughing instantly stopped. His smile replaced with a frown. Before he could say anything, Mike walked away. Destiny exited the blacksmith. Delighted after getting a sweet bargain. Her pleasure was cut short as she watched Mike walk past in visible distress. She walked over to Clyde, who was looking down on the ground. What's going on? Clyde said nothing, and continued to stare at the gravel road below him. Hello? Anyone in there? Clyde finally lifted his head and met her gaze. Sorry, I was just... deep in thought. What's going on with you two? <sighs> nothing, Destiny. Hey, the babe is back! Destiny spun around to find Lucas looking at her with a sly face. Who's this freak? Oh, such harsh words from such a pretty face. Lucas exaggerated, placing a hand over his heart. Truthful words. What's that? I couldn't hear you. Lucas said, putting his hand to his ear. He said they were truthful words. Such cruelty! 
Why'd you even come over here anyway? Oh, right. That weird old dude is in the village again looking for Mike. Oh, well, about that. Clyde looked up at the hill that Mike went up. Did you finally beat him in a duel and he's mad about it? Destiny and Clyde both looked over at Lucas and rolled their eyes. What? No, Lucas. Mike went home. Should we go after him? No, he's going through a real hard time right now. Leaving him alone might be the best idea. If you're an idiot. Destiny walked away from the situation and toward the blacksmith. She walked on out of sight from Clyde and Lucas, and followed where Mike left. Walking through the village, she found many emerald green eyes looking at her. Destiny made her way to the house. It had many windows on it, with one side of the house having blue windows, and the other having red. She looked in the red side to see if she could make anything out. After finding nothing, she saw herself in through the already open door. She'd find Mike staring out the window, expressionless. Michael? She said, walking forward. He said nothing and continued to stare. No emotion whatsoever seen in his face from the window reflection. What happened with you and Clyde down at the village? Nothing that you can fix. Just talk to me, Mike. What's going on? Mike let out a sigh. It's just too far beyond your understanding or comprehension. How do you know? Mike turned to face her, his eyes bloodshot and watery. Obviously, he had been crying. Mike, something keeps troubling you. It's not going to go away unless you talk about it. Mike said nothing and looked up at the ceiling. I see the hate in your eyes. Clyde might not see it, but I do. You're quite perceptive. However, you still couldn't possibly help. I appreciate that you want to, but trust me, it's beyond what you can fix. Give me a chance. Right now, the best thing you can do for me is to just let me be alone. What I told you to do from the beginning, a voice from behind said. Destiny jumped in surprise and turned around to face Clyde, who was showing visible signs of annoyance. Let's go. Clyde motioned toward the open door. The two exited the building, leaving Mike alone as he requested. Standing outside the door, Destiny looked up to Clyde and asked, Why? What's wrong with him? Clyde just sighed and said, Alright, it's gonna be a long story, so let's find a place to sit. They made their way to Mike and Clyde's fishing dock and sat at the very edge of the wooden structure. The water rippled gently as the day entered its final hours. Alright, tell me. Why does there always seem to be something troubling him? Remember when you told him that he isn't your father and he got upset? Yeah. This is gonna explain that too. Clyde closed his eyes and took a deep breath. You know, there was a time when Mike would fight with talent and grace instead of fueling himself with anger. A time when he used to be happy. One day, me and him were roaming through a forest in the middle of a stormy night. We were looking for an abandoned temple, rumored to be in the area. It was so dark, but the lightning lit up the area for brief instances. The storm was so bad, and even the mobs of the night were nowhere in sight. They didn't dare risk going out in that monster of a storm. Clyde paused and continued to breathe deeply. The sun began to finally rise, so we could start to see again. However, the storm still raged on. Mike said he saw a figure in the distance, sitting in front of a tree. We got our weapons out under the impression it was an enemy. But as we got closer, we saw that it was no enemy. It was a child. He was slouched up against the trunk of a tree, soaked in water and leaves. Mike checked for a pulse on the boy, but when he felt a heartbeat, he put the child over his shoulder and told me we had to go back home. Where did this kid come from? I don't know, but we took him home. Mike took good care to make sure that he made a full recovery. We tried to find his parents to return him, but we couldn't find them. The child couldn't recall anything before the storm, so we had no one to take the kid. Mike decided that we should take care of him. At, at first, I was against it. But Mike assured me that he could take on the responsibility. He decided to name the child Drake. Drake? Yeah, those two. <laughs> they did everything together. He taught Drake how to fish from the very lake. They'd have competitions to see who could make the most catches in a certain time frame. Drake would sometimes push Mike into the pond and laugh as Mike dragged him in too. He taught Drake how to cook, craft, build, and even to fight when he got older. Sounds like this kid means a lot to him. Mike once told me that Drake was like a son to him. He was everything to him. I see. Mike taught Drake to be a formidable swordsman. Drake was adventurous, just like Mike is. The three of us would go on adventures all the time. I 
could tell you so many stories of how Drake saved me and Mike's lives. This kid was such a warrior. But yet, he was still a child to the core. What happened to him? Clyde's eyes snapped open. He looked up at the slowly setting sun and gathered the strength to say the words he needed to say. One night, Mike and Drake went out to face the monsters, like they always did. It was a clear night, not a cloud in the sky. You could see all the beautiful stars above. Something was off, and we noticed it immediately. There were no monsters to be seen. They were just gone. I decided to stay inside the house that night and sleep it off. Mike and Drake went off to the forest to find some zombies. Still nothing. Mike proposed that they split up to cover more ground, so they did just that. As Mike continued running in his direction for a while, he stopped, dead in his tracks. He could hear a scream over in the opposite direction. He ran back as fast as he humanly could towards the sound. The screams then stopped. Mike kept running and running and running. He eventually found himself in an opening in the center of the forest. Clyde swallowed a gulp of air, his voice becoming shaky. He would find... find... Drake, on the ground, motionless. Mike went to his side to try and wake him up. He shook, he yelled, he did everything he could, but no response. That's when he noticed the sword stuck inside Drake's back. At first, he he was paralyzed. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. Once he snapped out of the trance, Mike let out screams, hollers, call him what you will. They were so loud and strong, I could hear him all the way over here. I would arrive at the scene and find Mike at Drake's side. The cries I heard, I didn't think he was capable of producing. His eyes were flooding with tears, his body was shaking like an earthquake, and his cries of agony were piercing. He put his trembling hand on Drake's lifeless cheek. <clears throat> when I saw them, I can never forget. I saw something in Mike's eyes that I had never seen before. I saw sadness, I saw anger, but overall what I saw the most in those eyes hate towards itself. Destiny couldn't think of any way to possibly respond to what she was hearing. From that day forward, Mike was never the same. That child was Mike's entire world. So when he lost him, it was like he lost his entire world. Mike blames himself for Drake's death. He says that if he hadn't suggested they split up, he'd still be alive. Mike acts happy and cheerful sometimes, but I know he never truly is. He simply puts up an act so that people don't feel bad for him. He also believes that showing his crippling depression inside is a sign of weakness. There is so much help, hatred in his heart, Destiny. So much pain, so much loss. I've I've tried everything to help him, but to no success. He just always wants to be alone. The anniversary of Drake's death is approaching. This is the time when it's hardest for Mike to hide his anguish. Destiny looked down in disbelief. So you see, when you told him that he isn't your father, you reminded him of his failure to protect his son. It's been four years, Destiny, but he still treats it like it just happened. I... I don't know. I know finding your words aren't easy with a story like that. Clyde says, leaning back on his two hands and looking at the pale sky slowly turning darker. Destiny leans forward on her knees and looks down at her reflection in the water. I just don't know what to do at this point. He lives every day pretending he's okay, but I know he isn't. He just needs to find a better distraction. Destiny quickly sits up. How's that supposed to work? I don't know. We just need to make him actually happy. Maybe we could find a new hobby for him? Something that doesn't remind him of Drake? Good luck with that. I've exhausted everything I can think of to try and help. But obviously it hasn't worked. Destiny again looked down at the rippling water beneath her feet. Well, we have to try something. He can't go through the rest of his life hating himself. We? Uh, yeah. There's no we in this one. I've done what I can. I'm not gonna waste my energy on something that's guaranteed to fail. Getting up off the wooden plank's dock, he took one last look at the rising moon above, then walked away. Destiny could only watch in shock, seeing how easily he could give up on his best friend. Faith Fulfilled, Book 1, Chapter 10, The Final Legacy Holder Walking around on the gravel roads of the village, Ray looked in awe. He hadn't seen a completely intact village in ages. Only villages that were still barely functional, or totally wiped out. Would you like to trade? asked a voice behind him. No, uh, thank you. But perhaps you can help me, Ray said, now facing the villager. 
The villager seemed uninterested. Can you tell me where Mike is? I need to have a talk with him. No, he left the village yesterday, and he didn't show up at all today. Strange, though. Clyde arrived early this morning. It's not common you see those two in separate places at once. Well then, is Clyde still here? I'm not sure. I last saw him at the librarian's building. I suggest you check there first. Thank you. Ray said as he walked away. Making his way toward the building, he ran into several villagers attempting to strike a deal. Not particularly in the bargaining mood, he said to each one on the way. Finally making his way up the stone stairs leading to the entrance, Ray entered the building to find Clyde hard at work in the village's sole crafting table. Hello there. Clyde was deep in thought, so he was startled at the sudden voice who entered his presence. Oh, hi there. Wait, are you the guy who beat Mike at a duel? Oh man, that was awesome how you- As much as I'd love to discuss that with you, I'm afraid I don't have time. Do you know where Mike is? Straight to the point, I see. Mike is at our house. He's not in the best of moods right now. Thank you for your help. Exiting the premises, Ray made his way to the home, finding the door yet again wide open. He was quite confused when he saw Michael sitting in a chair, staring endlessly at the wooden floor. What are you doing? Ray asked, walking in. Oh, it's you. What do you want? Come with me. We have much to talk about. Uh, okay. Rising from the chair, the father-son duo left the home and entered into an open field some distance from the house and village. Why are you taking me out this far? No one is to hear about what I am about to tell you. Alright, this is far enough. What do you need to tell me? Turning to face Mike, Ray said, What do you know about the legacy holders? Huh? Oh, well, they're people born with these weird powers who murder innocent people for their own amusement. Do you know what the legacy once was used for? Well, I read in one of the books I found in a stronghold that it was originally used to hold balance within the world, but somehow it turned into what it is today. Do you know what happened to the last legacy holder? According to the books, he broke free of the legacy's corruption, but before he could try and restore the broken balance, he was destroyed by his own father. Ray was the one who had created that book. He wanted his story to be known, so he left a book telling it in a stronghold. Somehow, Mike had found it and read through it. Most of that is true. However, there is one note that needs correction. Ray said, stepping forward a step. Mike put his fists up in defense. Ray was about to reveal the true fate of that legacy holder that was said to be destroyed, and who he really is. But something inside him said not to reveal the truth, that doing so would drive the boy mad. So he thought up a lie, so that Mike could be told of the legacy powers he had, but still not know of Ray being his father. Before that legacy holder was killed, he was able to spread his power to the people of the world. Ray lied. What do you mean? He was able to share his powers with the rest of the world. Because of this, people who were not born to the Campbell bloodline were being born with the power of the legacy. What? I haven't heard of this! Very few know about this. Unfortunately, most people who are born with a piece of this legacy holder's power do not ever realize it. As such, finding a being who holds it is extremely rare. How do you know about this? Because I am one of them, Ray said as he flexed his hand out, and a tree nearby began lifting into the air. The tree's leaves shook as the motion went upward. Releasing his grip, the tree slowly went back down into the ground. Mike was shocked. He had no way of finding a response to what he just saw. He'd read about these kinds of powers in books, but he never got the chance to see them in use right before his very eyes. His jaw dropped as far as his mouth would allow. Don't lose your head yet, because there's more. Ray took in a breath. The true holders of the legacy began taking notice of the power that the last legacy holder spread, after they killed him. They began hunting down and destroying those who he shared his power with. Those who held the legacy's power typically were targeted by large masses of monsters and servants of the corrupted legacy holders. Mike remembered how he was assaulted by two mysterious assassins in black a week ago, and how he always seemed to be faced by a small army of zombies. No way. Th this can't be. Mike thought to himself. Every day, the corrupted legacy holders kill more innocent people. They've been doing it for hundreds of thousands of years. It's time for the true purpose of the legacy to shine over the ones who abuse it. I have mastered my powers. I can teach you how to use yours. Join me, Michael, and together we can restore balance to the world, Ray said.
reaching his hand out. Confusion started to overwhelm Michael. If he had these powers this whole time, how had he not known of them? What about my friends? If I come with you, how will I still see them? You'll need to leave them behind. None of them can know your legacy holder. It could cause people to fear you. Ray said, still holding his hand out. Mike sighed and said, I can't. Clyde is like a brother to me. Isabella is a sister to me. And Frank is a father to me. I can't lie to them, let alone leave them behind. He felt conflicted. It will be for their safety, though, Mike. I know it'd be hard to leave them, but it's for their own good. Let Clyde come with us. He'd have nothing to do if I'm gone. Isabella and Frank have their village to keep them company. Impossible. How could you keep your powers a secret when he's around during our trainings? I wouldn't. Clyde wouldn't be scared of me, and he'd tell no one. He's trustworthy. We can't risk it, Michael. We can trust him. You have my word. He will not tell a soul. Ray growled under his breath and closed his eyes. If you are wrong, it will cost us, and the world, greatly. Mike nodded his head. Well then, are you going to join me? Ray asked again, holding his hand out. Mike took a moment to breathe, then took Ray's hand to signify his accepting of the offer. For now, go back to your home. I expect you at my home in a week. Say your goodbyes and explain the situation to Clyde. I understand. Mike said. Mike turned and went back towards the village, and Ray went the opposite way, to his home. When Ray returned home, he went to Destiny's house located nearby and knocked. Destiny opened the door, surprised to see Ray. Oh, hey Ray. What's going on? Your training partner will be arriving in a week. Before a response could even be made, he exited the premises, leaving Destiny to drown in thought. Walking up the hill leading to his home, Mike was also deep in thought. How do I tell him? He kept asking himself the whole way there. Walking in the door, he saw Clyde hard at work at the anvil repairing his sword and pickaxe, which had been damaged on his most recent mining trip. So, what did you find this time? Mike asked as he walked in. Clyde stopped his banging and said, I found a ton of gold, so we can make more golden apples, plus I found a lot of iron and redstone. Clyde said with a smile. Ha, huh. yeah, that should help. What's up, you still in a blue mood? N no not that. It's... Uh, you see... Mike couldn't find the words. Look, Clyde, we need to talk. Look, if it's about your missing pickaxe, I didn't take it. What? No, no, it's not th Wait, my pickaxe is missing? Uh, never mind. Uh, let's talk, shall we? Clyde dropped his tools and went to the couch along with Mike. Fiddling his fingers, Mike looked over to Clyde and thought in his head how exactly he's going to get this across. What kind of scenario would happen as a response? Clyde, you know about those legacy holders, right? Who doesn't? Those guys are destroying our world. He, yeah What's wrong, Mike? Clyde, have you ever wondered why we are targeted so much by the mobs? And those, I don't know, assassin-type people? I mean, we have a lot of resources. We have diamonds, emeralds, gold. We have iron. So there's a lot to be stolen if one gets past us. Yeah, but even before that, we had to deal with this kind of stuff. I guess. What, you think it might be something else? Mike freezes. Was he really going to tell him? Mike wasn't even sure for himself, but he knew that Clyde wouldn't want something like this to be hidden away from him. So with a shaky inhale, he blurts out. I might be a legacy holder. Mike squeezes his eyes shut, waiting for the outlash reaction from Clyde. But instead, Clyde starts laughing. Opening his eyes... Mike looks up at his laughing friend. What? What's so funny? I'm laughing because I thought you said you were a legacy holder. <laughs> I guess you've gained back your sense of humor. Mike bites his lip and brings his gaze to the ground. Clyde's laughter then comes to a halt. You don't seriously think that, right? Mike only gives a small shrug, still avoiding eye contact. For not just sake, you have got to be kidding me. I mean, first you go basically brain dead for the last couple of days or so, and now you come back and say you're a legacy holder? Are you sure you weren't hit in the head during that fight with the mystery guy? Clyde stops himself mid-sentence and freezes his movements. He then turns back to Mike. He's the one messing with your head. He's the one putting these thoughts in your head. Clyde grabs onto Mike's shoulder and shakes them. Come on, Mike. I've known you since forever. There is no way you could have be one of those disgusting, twisted monsters. You have morals. You're stronger than them. But, but what if I am? Mike yells, cutting Clyde off and shoving his hands from his shoulder. 
Clyde takes a step back. What if I am a legacy holder? Would you think of me as some disgusting, twisted monster? The two of them just stand there in silence. Mike looking anywhere but Clyde. No, I wouldn't. You aren't like them. Clyde says, almost monotone. That's what makes it so hard for me to understand how you, you of all people, could be related to the legacy holders. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it too, but I wanted to tell you now. I don't... I don't want things to change between us. Like you said, we've known each other since forever, and I don't want to lose my best friend too. Mike and Clyde both make eye contact, and in that moment things seem to connect all together, and the two of them have never been closer. So, my best friend is a legacy holder. So does that mean you can set things on fire? Sheesh, right to the point! But no, I don't know what I can do yet. Ray is gonna train me. So the guy who beat you. Really? Back at that again? Clyde only gives Mike a large grin in response. <sighs> You're such a blockhead! Just let it go! I got beat once! If this guy trains me too, I could beat you and make that twice. <laughs> yeah, we'll see about that, buddy. Oh, and there's another detail I forgot to mention. Oh, and that is? You're coming with me. Excuse me, what? Ray said I can take you along with me. Clyde, you're like a brother to me. I can't possibly leave you behind. Don't get all mushy on me now. Real funny. But seriously, it's already hard enough to leave Isabella, Frank, and even... <clears throat> Lucas. I can't leave you here all by yourself. Oh, how could I repay you, oh brave adventurer? Clyde overdramatizes, putting his hands to his forehead. Cut it out, you blockhead, or I'll leave you here anyway. Alright, alright. Well, can you tell me exactly where we're going? We're going to Ray's place. He's gonna train Destiny and myself on how to duel. But, he will also train me on how to use my legacy powers. And before you ask again, I don't know if I can shoot fire. Clyde lifted his finger. No, I don't know if I can summon lightning from the clouds either. Clyde drops his finger. This is probably going to be a long-term thing. I mean, we're going to be going after the legacy holders. Clyde's eyes widened in a snap. R what? Clyde! These monsters have been destroying our world for too long now. It's time to stand up to them. If we don't, who will? Clyde looked down to the floor with jaws dropped. Besides, the playing field will be even. Me and Ray are legacy holders ourselves, right? What use am I then? Maybe you could fight off the monsters and the other minions they have. Fair enough, I suppose. We're pretty much moving. We have a week until he expects us to arrive there. So we gotta pack up everything and say goodbye to the others. This is just a lot to take in all at once. I know. Oh, and another thing. Ray said that no one else is to know about me being a legacy holder. Not even Frank and Isabella? No. I wish I could tell them, but I need to stay true to my word. Alright. Mike walked to the window and put his hands behind his back, turned to Clyde, smiled, and said, It's time for our biggest adventure to begin. Faith Fulfilled, Book 1, Chapter 11. See you later, bite-sized. Six days was all that went by, but it seemed like it was six years. Normally, Clyde and Mike have an urge to go out and explore, but they didn't feel anything this time. Nothing. The eve of their departure had arrived. So how are we going to tell them? I don't really know. I didn't think that far ahead. Well, we can always tell them we're just going on another adventure. Yes, but we're usually back within a few days. Who knows when, or if, we're coming back. Both men stood puzzling, Clyde scratching his head, and Mike rubbing his chin. I think we just have to tell them a partial truth, Mike said, turning to Clyde. What do you mean? We tell them that there's a great threat, and we have to face it. But, we don't have to tell them that it's the legacy holders, or that I myself am a legacy holder. Good plan. We need to make it clear that we're going to be gone for a long time, and that we may never come back. Yeah. What's this I see? You getting nervous? Of course I am. We're going after the legacy holders. They have the power to wipe out entire villages with a finger. You forget, Clyde. I'm a legacy holder too. And so is Ray. I guess. But what if you can't beat them? We will, Clyde. We have to. With that, they exited their home and made their way down to the village below. 
As they entered, they fought back tears, as they knew this could very well be the last time they see their friends. Hey guys, why the long faces? Hey, can you get Isabella and Frank? There's something we need to discuss. Did Isabella dump you? Clyde gave Lucas a glare, making the point that this was no time for jokes. This was serious. Lucas found them and brought them to the librarian's house. Frank fiddled with the books in the bookshelves as he waited for Mike and Clyde's entrance. They finally did arrive, each with frowns on their faces. What's going on, you guys? Well, me and Clyde are going on a trip, Mike said, rubbing the back of his head. That's why you brought us here? You guys go on adventures all the time. Easy, Isabella. They have something important to say. What? Could he already know about where we're going? Clyde thought to himself. It's come to our attention that there is a large threat, and Clyde and I are going to be going after it. We... we don't know for how long we'll be gone, or if we'll ever return. Well, that's nothing new. You guys go on life-threatening journeys almost every day. Isabella, we're... Clyde reaches out to Isabella, but she slaps his hand away. All you two do is go on daring adventures and risking your lives. And for what? To give everyone that cares about you heart attacks? Isabella chokes out tears starting to fall. Isabella, you just need to understand that these boys aren't bound to this village. If they wish to risk their lives to seek adventure, you can't keep them grounded here. Frank says, bringing his crying daughter into his arms. I don't want them to leave again. I don't think my heart can take another goodbye thinking it might be the last. Isabella mutters, sobbing into her father's chest. Then let's not say goodbye. Clyde speaks suddenly. Isabella sniffles and turns to face him. What do you mean? How about a see you later? That way you'll know we'll see each other again. But what about us, Clyde? Huh? What about the promises we made? Do your stupid adventures mean more to you than me? Isabella's entire mood changed. She was furious and the fire in her eyes showed no sign of dimming, jabbing her finger into Clyde's chest with each and every word. I... I... Clyde starts to stutter out, but Frank places his hand on Isabella's shoulder, stopping her. That's enough, Isabella! You're acting like a child! But... But nothing! I know why Mike and Clyde need to leave. They have an important job to do, and yelling at them isn't going to make their going any easier. You know, don't you? Mike speaks up, his gaze at the ground. Everyone's head snaps to him. You think after raising you for so long, you think I wouldn't have noticed you were special? Special? What do you mean, special? Our dear friend Mike... Frank pauses. ...is a legacy holder. The room fell silent. If someone took their sword out, the sound would have sliced right through the air like a knife through butter. No one knew what to say or do. All they could do was stand there and wait for someone else to speak up. How? Isabella mutters, cutting the silence. She was looking at the ground and her fists were clenching and unclenching. There's no way he could be one of those unruly poisonous rats. You know I'm not like that. Do I? Do I know you at all? Isabella glares. How do I know you haven't been fooling us this whole time? How can I trust you when you can't even tell me who you are? Isabella, he isn't tricking us. He's always been the caring, protective guy he was raised to be. I don't want to hear anything from you anymore. Isabella growls out, with fresh tears seeming to form in her still anger-ridden eyes. Nothing you say can make me feel better. Nothing you say will bring me joy like it used to. Isabella, I know this is hard for you to process and understand. I want to stay with you to earn back your trust and show you that even if I now have the title of a legacy holder, that I'm still the same person that helped you take those first steps. I'm still the person that cares about you. But I don't have the time to convince you how I'm still that person. We have to go. I'm sorry things turned out this way. No one in the room moved or said a word. Mike then let out a sigh and started towards the door. The sound of pounding footsteps following after him, and before he can get his hand on the door, he's slightly set off balance by a hug from behind. Just don't die, okay? I mean it. Isabella mutters into Mike's back. I can't make any promises, but I'll try. Isabella lets him go, 
and Mike turns back to her and pulls her into a proper hug. You guys bring me back a present from your adventure. That way you'll have a reason to come back. Clyde walks over and joins into the group hug. You already are my reason for coming back. What? I'm not getting involved in this? Get over here, old man. And the four of them fall into a big group hug. Frank is the first to pull away. It's time. You two go on. You have a long journey ahead of you. Don't you dare leave us and the world disappointed. Isabella points at their faces. I'll always leave the world disappointed. Clyde jokes, earning a hard smack on his arm from Isabella. I mean it! Okay, okay. Clyde says, putting his hand up in defense. He then leans down and gives her a peck on the cheek. I'll miss you too, bite-sized. I told you to stop calling me that. But it's cute. And making you pout makes you even more adorable. Okay, lovebirds, let's go. Mike says, grabbing Clyde's shoulder, making his farewell salute. Two fingers together against his forehead. Faith Fulfilled. Book 1. Chapter 12. A Ruthless Teacher. As promised, on the seventh day, Mike and Clyde finally arrived at Ray and Amy's house. Destiny was there to greet them. Clyde made a glare in Destiny's direction upon laying eyes on her. Something in your eye? Something on your face? Really? That response? You're like 20. Aren't you in your 20s too? I'm 19, thank you. Oh, sorry. You're still a child. Don't test me. I'm good with a sword. You want to test that theory? Clyde said, pulling out his sword. Ladies, ladies, calm down. Mike says, sticking his hands out. I am 10 times more manly than this guy, so I don't know who you're calling a lady. We just got here. Fighting is unnecessary right now. Let's just start off on a clean slate, okay? Fine. I was gonna wipe the floor with him anyway. Destiny says, turning to walk toward the house. Why are you so hostile towards him? Mike asks, jogging up to walk next to her. He was the one glaring at me. You can ask him what his problem is. Destiny brushes him off and walks ahead as Mike slows down to wait for his friend to catch up. What happened back there? Nothing, Michael. Just forget about it. Clyde puts his hands up. Uh, alright then. Just, in the future, can we get along? We are gonna have to work as a team, after all. I might have to work with her. Doesn't mean I have to like her. Please? Just don't kill each other. Fine. Clyde walks ahead toward the house, with Mike following two steps behind. They stood in front of their cabin, that Ray personally built for them, taking a long look at the exterior before entering the doors. Inside, the cabin was cold and empty. The only things Ray provided for them inside were beds to sleep in and two furnaces to cook in. Everything else they'd have to find for themselves. There wasn't even any coal in the furnaces to fuel the fires. Well, first things first. We need to get some heat in here, because the taiga is so cold. The guy could have at least given us some coal to light the furnaces. That would have made things a little better. Even the beds are cold. Glad exclaims as he sat down on one. Well, I guess you called dibs on that bed. I don't want that one now. It has your stench on it. Stench? Why, you... Easy there, big fella. Once you guys have settled in, come on out to the living room. Ray calls out from behind the door. Clyde and Mike simultaneously jump startled. Do you think he heard us? Shh! Shut up, Clyde! Yes, I can hear you. Now quit fooling around and get ready. I think he has psychic powers. He does, you idiot! That's why we're here! Right. I knew that. Clyde says, and bolts after him. Ray watches as the two men exit the bedroom and make their way to the center of the room. I'm sure you've noticed by now that you don't really have that much to start out with. I've given you the essentials. Let me make one thing very clear. You are not here to have fun. You are here to train for our stand against the legacy holders. Jeez, starting off strong already. Clyde whispered. Clyde, you start training in the morning. For now, just get whatever it is you will need for your cabin. Mike, you and Destiny are with me at sundown. Isn't that a little dangerous being out at night? If any monsters come at us, we can use them as training dummies. Now do whatever it is you want to do within the premises until tonight. I'll see you then. Ray said, exiting the cabin. Wow, he is a lot less formal than he was before. Throughout his entire walk back to the house, Ray never stopped scowling. Opening the doors, he let out a large sigh. Are they here? Amy asked as he walked in. Yes. Yes, they are. What's wrong? I just don't think this was a good idea at all. Mike is a threat to all of us, and you want me to train him? Are we really going to do this again? Mike is not a threat. He is your son. He's... Our son! Yes, and it's because of the fact that he is my son that he is such a threat. He has the power to lay waste to what is left of this world. He is a monster, Amy. A monster! You never even gave him a chance! 
Even when he was born, you hated him. You can't say these things, Ray. You don't even know him. And neither do you. So let's get to know him. No, we can't risk him knowing who we are to him. And why not? Because I don't want him to end up as I did. Evil runs in my family's veins. Everyone, everyone in my family has turned into those legacy holders that is burning this entire world to the ground. You think if he found out that he is related to the son and brother of a legacy holder that he would be happy and want to have a family reunion? You're pushing your son away like your father did when he found out you were turning away from evil. You don't understand. Then let me try to understand, Ray. Please, let me listen to what you're going through. Sundown is going to be happening soon. I should get ready for training. Talk to me, Ray! Ray said nothing and walked out the door towards the training ground. Amy was left to stare in astonishment. No, no, no. That goes here, and that goes there. Clyde, I can't hold this much longer! Mike said, balancing a bunch of paintings in his hands. Just wait one more minute. Too late! Mike, I said one more minute. And I said we didn't need 20 paintings! There are only 10. Besides, you're a legacy holder. You're supposed to be able to hold things. Clyde, as soon as I learn to use my powers, the first person I'm using them on is you. How flattering. How immature. Ray said from behind. Yeah, you didn't scare us this time. Clyde said, turning around. That wasn't my goal. Well, Clyde, I guess you can handle the mess here. Mike said, looking at the shattered glass on the floor. Wait, what? Have fun! Mike smiled as he left with Ray. Ray and Mike walked down the dirt road toward the training grounds. Throughout the whole way, Mike could feel that something was troubling Ray, but he never said anything, as he did not want to anger him any more than he already was. They finally reached their destination, a decent-sized opening in the taiga forest, covered in shallow snow, and the lands were perfectly flat. The sky above was clear as could be, not a cloud to be seen. The temperature was below freezing and Mike shivered in the cold. Looking up from the snowy ground, Mike saw Destiny sitting on a log. She had been waiting for their arrival, so she could finally start training with her new partner. What took you so long? Destiny asked, standing up from the log. Mike here was busy messing around with paintings. <laughs> well, we're quickly losing moonlight, so let's go. See that tree over there? Yeah. Lift it. Uh, okay. Mike started walking toward the tree. No, not with your hands. With your mind. Excuse me? Just try. Uh, shouldn't you show me how to do that before asking me to actually do it? Are you questioning my teaching methods? Uh, yeah? Oh no. Here we go. Suddenly, the tree was flying towards Mike at the full force, and Mike only barely dodged in time. What the hell was that?! It was a tree. Were you not paying attention when it was hurtling toward you? Ray says with a straight face. Mike said nothing. He had no response. How could he? He looked over at Destiny, who was in equal shock. She knew Ray was a tough teacher, but he was never this tough. Now try to lift the now uprooted tree. I showed you how, didn't I? Yeah, but you didn't show me how the process works! Oh, shall I throw another one? <laughs> no need! I got the picture the first time! Very good. Now, lift it. Mike raised his hand in the direction of the uprooted tree. He tried with every fiber of his body to make the tree levitate from the ground. Oh, come now. I completely chucked the tree and you can't even lift it! I'm sorry that this is a little new to me! You should be sorry. You can't even lift the damn thing. Show me how! And not by throwing an entire tree at me! Focus on the tree. Imagine the tree in the air, then do it. Mike groans, then turns to the tree and lifts his hand to try again and lift it. Closing his eyes. He imagines the tree hovering in mid-air. He opens his eyes, and the tree is unmoved. Closing his palm and lowering his hand, Michael says, I can't. What you ask of me is impossible. Impossible? The task is only impossible because you have deemed it so. Mike says nothing. What's wrong? Have you nothing to say? No more iron nerve left in that tiny brain of yours? Silence. If you aren't willing to try, then I am not willing to train you. I knew this would be a complete waste of time! Ray yells, walking away. Mike clenches his fists and starts walking after him when he feels a warm hand on his shoulder. Don't. He's not worth it. Mike turns to look at her with anger in his eyes. Not towards her, but at himself for his failure. It's pretty cold out here. You and Clyde's cabin is pretty far from here. 
Come on, let's go to my place where it's warm. N no, you don't have to. I insist. Besides, I'm sure Clyde will ask you millions of questions about that mark on your cheek. Mark? What mark? Mike feels his cheeks and finds a sharp pain in his left cheek. Oh. All right, fine. Mike grumbles. They exit the training grounds and head toward Destiny's house. Mike was very thankful for having boots on. Otherwise, he'd have to deal with the numbing cold of wet snow below with each step. Destiny's house was a large wooden structure with lots of glass windows. There was a porch at the uppermost center of the front, with fences on the ends to prevent falling. The top of the roof couldn't even be seen since it was completely covered in snow. Walking inside, the floors were covered in a soft red carpet. When Mike removed his boots, the feeling of the carpet was comforting to his aching feet. There was a large main room, which had a counter. Behind the counter was a furnace and a crafting table. In front of the oven was a table, made from a fence and a pressure plate. On either side were wooden stairs, used as seats. The house had plenty of torches inside, that kept it lit up. The house was also quite warm and toasty inside, perfect for a biome like the taiga biome, which is freezing cold throughout the year. Wow, this is a nice place you have here. It's so warm, too, Mike said, removing his armor. Thank you. Now, let's get that wound of yours fixed up, Destiny said, looking through her chest for medical supplies. That tree must have grazed me pretty bad. I probably didn't feel it because my cheeks were numb from the cold. Mike thought. Destiny took cocoa beans, a water bucket, a milk bucket, and paper out of her chest. Over here, if you will, she said, motioning to the chair. Mike took a seat, and Destiny walked forward, wetting the paper with the water. She dabbed the wet paper on the wound. Mike grunted a little with each dab. Man, he got you good. If your cheek wasn't hard enough from the cold, you'd have lost a lot more blood than you did. She said as she continued patting. Yeah, goody for me. Destiny continued to wipe the wound clean from any blood. There you go. You should be safe from any infection, though. She smiled. Th thank you. Destiny walked back to her chest and took out two glass bottles, then walked behind the counter with a milk bucket and cocoa beans. She poured crushed cocoa beans in each bottle, then poured the milk in. She then mixed the liquid well. Crouching down, she proceeded to heat up the chocolate milk with the heat from the burning of furnace. When did Ray tell you? She asked, still heating the drinks. Pardon? When did he tell you that you were a legacy holder? Oh, that. Well, he kind of just showed up to my village and took me far away to tell me. He just showed up uninvited? Pretty much, yeah. That sounds just like him. She took the heated bottles away from the furnace and mixed them again. Why is he like this? Destiny sighed and said, I don't know, Mike. He means well, but he's just... kind of a jerk. With the two bottles in hand, she walked back over to Mike and handed him one of the bottles. That should help warm you up. Thank you, Mike said, removing the top of the bottle. Outside, the winds began to pick up, and snow started to fall. A calm night, interrupted by a strong winter storm. Looks like we got in just in time. Good thing you didn't try to get back to the cabin. You'd be stuck in the storm. Thanks for letting me come here. I'd rather have you here than a popsicle version of yourself. Yeah, me too. Mike took a large sip from his bottle of hot chocolate. It was soothing to his sore throat as it made its way down. The sweetness of the chocolate was perfect for a mind at unrest. His eyes felt heavy, not with exhaustion, but with depression. Destiny noticed it right away. You seem unsettled. What's wrong? She asked, placing a hand on his shoulder. It's nothing. I can read your facial expressions and your body language. Something is bothering you. Talk to me. I guess I'm just a little homesick. I miss my house, and even more... I miss my friends. Isabella, Frank, Lucas. I just left them all behind, Mike said, looking down at the carpet. Isabella was so upset when she found out we were leaving. All me and Clyde ever do is go on life-threatening adventures. Isabella and the others would just sit there, waiting for us to return, not even knowing if we ever would. She was there to support us. She did so much for us. And what did we do to repay her? We just left her behind. Mike, why did you come here? Uh, to train? Train to fight who? The legacy holders. Correct. So, in a sense, you left so you can protect them. So you didn't leave them behind. But rather, you're helping to protect them. But I can't even lift a stupid tree right! How am I gonna face some super-powered demons if I can't even lift a tree? You'll learn it in time. I promise you will. Ray is a tough teacher, but he knows what he's doing. 
Besides, I'll always be there rooting you on. I mean, you're my training partner after all. She said with a smile. Mike pulled up his head to face her and let out a small smile of his own. Faith Fulfilled, Book 1, Chapter 13, The First Mission The howling of Mother Nature's fury lasted throughout the night. Icicles and heavy snow sat on the roof of the cabin. Destiny offered to let Mike stay the night, to avoid traveling the storm, but Mike politely refused, not wanting to burden her. He made his way through the terrible storm for hours before he finally made it back. Entering the cabin, he couldn't feel a large portion of his body. Making his way to the bedroom, he crashed onto the bed and immediately let the darkness take him. It seemed like he had just gotten into bed when he heard a voice say, Get up! Mike sprung out of bed. Looking in front of him, he sees Ray with his face swelling red. You've slept long enough. Both of you have. Now get ready and meet me at the training grounds. Before a response could be made, Ray slammed the door behind him and exited the cabin. Such a pleasant fellow, groaned Clyde as he rolled out of bed. You have no idea. Well, let's not anger him anymore by being late. Let's get moving. They would do whatever morning routines they could with the resources they had available. And then Mike led Clyde to the trading grounds. There was still some snow falling from the sky, but not nearly as hard as it was overnight. Mike's legs ached with every step. Lips blue, eyes watering, body shaking. Destiny was sitting on her log again when they made their way there. But Ray was nowhere to be seen. So this is the training grounds? It's just an open field. You don't need anything but a lot of space for the kind of training you'll be going through. Destiny said, getting up off the log. Well, that's comforting. Where's Ray? No idea. He wasn't here when I got here either. Clyde felt a jolt hit the back of his head. He spun around to find out what had hit him. He found a wooden stick at his feet in the snow. Looking up, he saw Ray with his hand stretched out. In the other, he held three more sticks. Keep your guard up. That was totally uncalled for. Exactly. You should be prepared for the unexpected. Well, that's kind of an oxymoron. Ray flexed his hand out and moved all three sticks to the remaining two trainees. All picking up their sticks, they awaited further instruction. The legacy holders and their minions do not play fair. They will try to attack you when you least expect it. As such, you need to be ready for things that you can't anticipate. I guess that makes sense. You guess? Ray, can we just get on with the lesson? Fine. Let's get on with it. Clyde, I want you to try and hit Mike with your training sword. It's just a stick. It's not even a- Do it! Okay, fine. Sheesh. Hours and hours of training. Fighting with sticks, running around the training course, and fighting with your hands. Mike, of course, had the worst of it. Because after he did all that, he had to train with the legacy. Once Clyde's and Destiny's training was complete, Clyde ran back to the cabin to crash. But Destiny stayed behind. Just lift the tree already! It's not that complicated! It is complicated, though! Just as he said this, he witnesses the tree lift in the air. Ray's hand flexed out toward the tree. Did that look complicated to you? Now do it! Mike grunts and continues to fulfill his teacher's wishes, but no matter how hard he did try, the tree never moved. Michael, if you can't move a tree, then how do you expect to stop the legacy holders? I... No. No more. I've only had two training sessions with you, and I can already tell I am just wasting my time. I could be using this time to track them down, but instead I'm sitting here, dealing with your failure! Now try again! The clouds circled around the dark castle. The barrier between the overworld and the nether had been breached, for a transmission between the two worlds was to be heard. Has Ray recruited the boy? The figure in black smoke asked. As you predicted. Brian answered, bowing his head. Excellent. What are your new orders, father? With Michael and his friend gone, the village is unprotected. Deal with the villagers as you've dealt with the sun. Show no mercy. It will be done. The smoke dissipates. Brian gets up from the ground and redirects the orders to his minions. With a nod of their heads, the undead corpses and bags of bones make their way out of the castle and toward their unsuspecting targets. Torture. That is the only word that could accurately describe the next several hours for Mike. His hands had been raising and lowering, his ears had been picking up insulting shouts, and his mind was cracking from the inside, Ray's voice getting raspier with each yell. Throughout it all, Destiny watched in disgust at Ray's treatment of Mike. When the session had finally ended, 
The young legacy holder was exhausted. Unbeknownst to anyone at the training grounds, in the distance, Amy was watching in equal disgust. When Ray finally exited the premises, Amy revealed herself to Mike and Destiny, who were still present. Amy? When did you get here? I've been here all along, unfortunately. I'm sorry you had to witness my failures. You didn't fail, Mike. Ray is just a stubborn man. Understatement of the century. If anyone is failing, it's Ray. He's failing to properly teach you how to use your abilities. Wait, how do you know I'm a legacy holder? And how do you know Ray? And how does Destiny know you? I have so many questions! Chillax. Amy here is Ray's wife? That answer all the questions rattling in your head? Oh, Yep, pretty much. Goodness. Perhaps I should have introduced myself from the start. Maybe. Destiny rolled her eyes. Amy was trying to her very best to suppress the overwhelming emotion she was feeling from finally getting to meet her son. She wished she could see him now in a better state than the one he was in. You guys should get back to your cabins. It's past midnight. Amy said, looking up into the sky to see the moon all the way up. And so, they each bid each other goodbye and head off in their separate shelters. Through his entire walk back, Mike couldn't stop thinking about how he couldn't use his power. If he would ever be able to protect those he cared for from the legacy holders. Sleep did not come easily to Mike that night. He did not stop thinking about the same thing from when he got into bed until he was awoken by Ray once again in the morning. Mike expected another grueling training session, but this time, Ray had something different in store. Look who decided to show up early. Destiny said as Mike entered the training grounds. Not by my own choice. Ray woke me up this early. Figured. That's enough chit-chat, Ray said, walking in front of them. It's clear that Mike is too incompetent to use his powers correctly. Mike clenched his fists. So instead, you two will be sent on missions. What about Clyde? He will remain here and train under me. Maybe he will properly listen to my instructions. So, basically, while Clyde is training, we're gonna be running your errands? Pretty much. This is absurd! I did not leave my home to come here and waste time doing your laundry. Quiet down, boy. These missions I have will help you and Destiny learn to use your natural abilities. If we're lucky, then perhaps you will tap into your own powers as well. I'm listening. Well, that's a first for you. Speaking of first, your first mission is to find a village. Villages are not found in the biome we currently stand in, so you will need to travel outside it. Remember, villages are rare, so you will need to look very hard. Also remember that villages are found in deserts and flatlands. What do we do when we find a village? If. If you find a village. And if that scenario comes into play, I want you to observe the villagers' behaviors. Observe. You want us to observe. What do you hope to gain by knowing how villagers act? That is classified. Now, this is going to take time. I want you to bring crafting tables, furnaces, coal to fuel them, beds, extra clothing to wear, swords, pickaxes, torches in case you need to mine, an axe, and a supply of wooden planks for crafting. Am I clear? Crystal. Mike said angrily. With that, Ray left for his house. Mike and Destiny turned to look at each other. Think you can put up with me? I think I'll manage. You're not that bad. <laughs> so, I'll meet you at your place. That sound alright? Sounds good to me. I'll see you then. Luckily, Clyde was not in the cabin when Mike arrived. This saved Mike the effort he'd need to make to explain to Clyde what was going on. Mike grabbed everything that Ray instructed him to, and left the cabin. Making his way through the snowy forest to Destiny's house, he felt like he was being watched. He knew that Ray was watching somewhere, making sure that he did as he was told. Reaching Destiny's house, he found her waiting outside the door for him. You ready? She asked, walking up to him. Ready as I'll ever be, I guess. And the two headed northward for their first of many adventures together. This would be the beginning of a long, strong bond. Faith Fulfilled, Book 1, Chapter 14 Frigid Travels We've been walking for days, and we're not even out of the taiga yet, Mike complained. Shivering with each step he took, days started to get shorter and each night was colder than the last. They predicted a storm was coming soon, and knowing Mike's luck, it would arrive at the worst possible moment. Those clouds do not look happy, Destiny said, looking up into the sky. No, they don't. But I think we have some time before the storm starts. 
We should use this time to get a little farther and pick up some resources to help us when we ride out the storm. Perhaps we can look for a hill to dig into. It would be quicker and require less effort just to dig into a hill instead of building up a shelter. We can block off the entrance when the storm starts and plop our stuff down inside. Sounds like a plan to me, Mike said, looking around for a suitable hill. What do you even look for in a suitable hill? He thought to himself. Most of them were either made of dirt, gravel, or stone. Stone would be the sturdiest, but would take the longest to dig through, and the sun was already starting to go down. Gravel was well out of the question. One wrong move and suddenly you're suffocating. Dirt was the best option out of the three, especially on short notice, so he headed towards a tall, dirt hill surrounded by intensely by trees. Found one that looks good! He called to Destiny. Okay, great. She said without even glancing over. You start digging through. Make sure there is space that can fit both of us. I'm gonna try and find some animals for food because we're running low. She started walking to a different part of the forest. Mike wanted to stop her, to tell her that they could find fruit somewhere. But he knew it would be a useless endeavor. The only fruit you could find in the wild was apples and watermelons, neither of which were even in the taiga biome. Plus, meat would be more filling and last longer. He just always hated the idea of killing helpless animals, even if it was for food. After watching her leave, he turned to the hill, readying his wooden shovel. Let's hope this doesn't break on me. Two hours go by, and the wooden shovel in Mike's hand is barely holding together after being used so many times. During the middle of the process, he had to take out his pickaxe to break some stone he ran into. When he finished, the wooden shovel was nothing more than chunks on the ground. Mike placed his crafting table and furnace side by side against one of the stone walls. Using some wood he chopped from outside, he crafted a large chest to store the items they each had. Before they left, Destiny had found two poorly thrown together sleeping bags they could use because, despite what Ray had said, they couldn't bring breads along and didn't want to keep making them each night. Destiny returned with a chicken and some raw pork chop. Alright! That should do nicely. Much better than the moldy bread Ray gave us. And probably better for our health, too. Yeah, this should last for the next few days. I'm not the best cook. I usually just bring enough from the beginning. What about you? Any good at cooking? I think I am. Clyde always makes fun of my cooking, though. Probably because I always rip on his. Poor fool doesn't know a soup from a stew. Good. Just hand me some coal and I can get the furnace warmed up. Sure thing. Mike paused for a moment, trying to remember where he'd placed the coal. When he went back to the chest, it wasn't there. He moved to his bag but found it empty. I'm pretty sure you're the one who has it, he said to Destiny while still looking. No, I told you to carry it because the coal stash was closest to your room. Well, I don't have it. Maybe... He stopped mid-sentence, remembering what had happened. The day before, Mike had tripped while they were climbing a hill. He dropped his bag when he fell and attempted to catch himself. It rolled a little ways down the hill when he dropped it. But when he finally did find his bag, he quickly picked it up and ran out to catch up with Destiny. The bag had seemed lighter than he remembered, but he didn't think to question it at the time. The coal had fallen out of his bag and rolled down the hill without him even noticing. What seemed like a blessing at the time now turned into trouble for them. They were now going to have to go through the night without food to eat or any warmth. If they didn't find coal soon, they would likely either freeze or starve to death. Mike suddenly felt a chill down his spine. He didn't know if it was from the cold air or from his nerves. Did he really feel this worried about some coal? Looking up, he realized the situation was much worse. In the midst of all his digging, he had forgotten to get some extra wood to make a door. There was nothing blocking the entrance outside, and it started to snow quickly. Destiny had realized this almost immediately after him, and was already grabbing whatever loose rocks she could to cover the open hole. When the hole was finally covered, the hiding place was shown to be almost pitch black. Hopefully the storm dies soon, Mike said warily, as if he had already guessed it wouldn't die down for a while. We hardly have the resources to stay for more than a few days. Yeah, hopefully. For now, we should probably sleep. Guess we'll be stuck with this moldy bread for a little while. At least it's cold enough that the meat won't rot. We should head to sleep now. Right. They headed towards the sleeping bags. Destiny got in with ease. She moved like a cat. One would even think she could see in the dark. Unlike Destiny, Mike managed to trip on a rock while trying to get to a sleeping bag. There was a loud thud. Nice one, doofus. 
Destiny managed to say through her laughter. You know, I don't have night vision like you apparently do. Both laughing, they finally made it to their sleeping bags. Though the covers provided some protection from the unforgiving air, it didn't nearly provide enough to give any comfort to either of them. Destiny shivered and scooted closer to Mike. He began to blush and wanted to say something, but remained silent in his discomfort. Oh, shut it. These sleeping bags aren't blocking out the storm enough, and we need the body heat. Just go to sleep and we won't talk about it. She then turns over and seemingly falling asleep, leaving Mike alone with his thoughts. He wondered how much longer they would be stuck in the hideout. Eventually, his eyes started to droop, and sleep consumed him. Just like the room he fell asleep in, he found himself in complete darkness. But while he could not see anything, he could hear a distant sound. A voice. But whose he couldn't make out. It was getting louder, and it was calling his name. As the voice got closer, he began to recognize the voice. No! Please stop! You don't have to do this! As the voice got closer, he began to recognize it. Mike could hear the sounds of people screaming in terror in the background. Fires crackling, structures collapsing, and zombies groaning. He was puzzled, trying to figure out what he was listening to. Finally, the darkness began to brighten up, and he saw he was up in the sky, looking down at a village completely covered in flames. He watched as villagers ran in terror, but they seemed to be looking up at him. Then the voice he heard before returned. It was... Isabella? He was now able to see her looking up, pleading with him. Stop this! She begged with tears in her eyes. She was looking right at him, her body trembling, along with the rest of the land. The ground cracked, and lava was spouting out of the holes in the soil. The air was hot, as hot as a volcano. This heat was overwhelming. He had just been in a room that was freezing cold, now he found himself in the air. Air that was boiling. The next thing he saw, he could never forget. He saw Isabella standing feet firm on the ground, melting away. He reached out to try and pull her out, but he was just too high up in the sky. Isabella disappeared underneath the boiling hot ground. Mike was in shock. Everything had happened so fast he had had no time to comprehend what just happened. Before he could make up a response to what he just saw, the scene went dark. The overwhelming heat was replaced with a chilling cold. At first, Mike was confused, but soon he understood where he was. He was back in the shelter. But what he didn't know was, was that a dream? Was it even a dream? It seemed so real. Maybe it was a sign, a warning of some kind. These thoughts were completely replaced when he remembered that destiny was literally less than an inch away from him. Mike was no stranger to this. He's been in this type of situation before with Clyde. They were once trapped in the taiga biome during a storm where their temperatures took a nosedive, having to rely on each other's body heat to survive. But this felt different. Not just because Destiny is a girl, but something he couldn't quite explain. Mike noticed a silver light entering the room from a small hole in the entranceway. Rolling out of the sleeping bag, he grabbed more stone and began filling the hole when he noticed something. A piece of stone was darker than the rest. In fact, it looked... black. Could it be? No. Is it coal? It was dark in the room. He could have easily not seen it. He picked up the dark object and examined it closer. Yep, no doubt about it. That's coal, all right. Mike thought, avoiding the possibility of waking Destiny. He quickly found a stick, made a torch, and lit it up. The heat from the torch immediately relieved Mike of the chill he had felt all morning. He placed the torch close to the sleeping bag so that they could be warm, but not before he lit up the furnace putting in some spare sticks he had kept. The meat that Destiny had collected was still in her bag. It was cold to the touch, and Mike almost dropped it, but he placed the meat in the furnace. Hopefully, in an hour or so, the meat would be fully cooked. He heard a growl nearby. Readying his sword to fight off a monster, he noticed there was nothing there. When he heard it again, he looked through the hole in the entrance. Still nothing. Suddenly, Destiny groaned as a third growl was heard. She sat up, holding her stomach. The sound was not a monster at all, just the sound of her hunger. They hadn't eaten the night before, so they wouldn't get sick from the raw meat. She sniffed the air. Mike could see the yearning in her eyes for something filling. What is that smell? She noticed the hideout was much brighter than it had been the day before. When she felt the warmth beside her, 
She turned to see the torch by the sleeping bags. You found the coal? No. Wait. Yes. No, but yes. Ah! I'm just going to start over. I found some coal in the makeshift door we built, so I took it and replaced it with some actual stone. So you mean we could have had some warmth all night? Ugh, I can't believe I missed that. The pork chops will be done in an hour or so. Want to see if it's okay to go outside? Maybe find some wood? More coal? Yeah, why not? Destiny stared blankly ahead of her, lost in thought. Her face looked troubled. Hey, what's up? You okay? Huh? Oh, yeah, sorry. Just... a bad dream. You gonna be okay? Yeah, I'll be fine. Nothing a little fresh air can't fix. She then gets up from her seated position and heads out for the opening. That's strange. Mike thought. He knew everyone got bad dreams, not just him. But what were the chances of them both having one the same night? His questions would have to wait as an abrupt yell cascaded into his ears. Mike quickly runs outside and sees a line of skeletons hiding in the tree line's protective shade, with bows drawn back and ready to fire. He quickly rolls out of the way and scans the area. He sees Destiny strategically dodging arrows and getting closer to the skeletons. Destiny slices through the air with her sword, and moves from skeleton to skeleton, like rapids in a stream cutting through all her obstacles. It was like watching a ballerina dance across the stage, except in the end, she was the only one left to bow. Wow. His jaw dropped. What are you staring at? You're not the only one who can use a sword. She said with a smirk. Y yeah I know. But you just... You just caught me off guard. What? Girls can't fight? Is that what you're trying to say? N no Absolutely not! Destiny lets out a short laugh. It's fine. No need to overthink it. You already do enough of that on your own. I don't know whether to be insulted or... There you go, overthinking things, yet again. Yep, insulted it is. Well, overthinkers get pork chops. Hey, I worked hard for those. After the two had finished fighting over who got the pork chop, they broke down their temporary home and started back on their journey to find a village. They walked in peaceful silence with sticks and leaves crunching under their feet. So, how did you meet Ray? Mike spoke up, breaking the comfortable walking silence. He kidnapped me. What? <laughs> You should have seen your face. Yeah, ha ha. Ray may be a hardhead sometimes, but he isn't evil. So how did you really meet? Well, I was maybe around 14 years old is when we first met. I grew up in a small village similar to the one you're from. I was born in your stereotypical nuclear family. One dad and one mom. Life was simple. And there was rarely ever any change. Then one particularly unlucky night, a large horde of zombies attacked my village, and many of our guards and trained fighters were injured. When the day broke, the zombies had gone back to their caves, and my village was left in shambles. As the day went on, the few of us that weren't nursing their wounds, or helping the wounded, were out digging through the remains of the crumbled houses. We all thought that that night was going to be our last. But? I sense a but coming. But? Then Ray came along. He was traveling in the forest near our village, and he had said that he saw a faint torchlight and started his way over to where we lived. That night, he protected all of us. He fought a horde much stronger and bigger than the night when everything fell apart. Because of him... My village was safe. Also, because of him, I had this new surge to do something. Something bold and new. He sensed this with me and trained me to become a sword fighter. He was tough on me, but I was determined to learn. I wanted to be strong enough to protect my village as he did. After I had grown in my training and in age, he asked me if I would accompany him and his wife in the taiga biome they are in so I could continue my training. I instantly agreed and left. What about your family? My family was upset, of course, but I was determined to train harder so I could protect them. She pauses as memories begin to flood back. They didn't make it. A little after we had left, I got news that another horde hit my village and left nothing but smoke and ash. I'm so sorry that happened. Don't be. Not having any family ties makes it easier to fight. No one to worry about going back to. 
Destiny plasters a smile on her face, and they fall back into a silent rhythm of crunching leaves. Attachment isn't a weakness. In fact, in times when I needed to protect someone I cared about, I increased my skill by doing so. Yeah. Until you're protecting yourself from them. Faith Fulfilled Book 1 Chapter 15 Temptation As the duo made their way through the mountains, they began to notice the clouds above were beginning to clear up. The frigid temperatures they suffered were slowly fading away, the snow melting and the ground turning muddy. The mountains in front of them were getting smaller and smaller in height. This must be the end of the biome. It's getting warmer. You think we're getting close to a jungle? I don't think so. You feel that? The air is getting drier. In jungles, the air is humid. Plus, we've been walking toward the leeward side of the mountain, hence the clouds thinning. I understood the first part, but the second part was in some nerdy language I don't understand. Didn't you ever learn a little science? Well, considering we don't have any schools around here, nope. Plus, I'm a survivalist, not a scholar. That's for sure. Well, Professor Smart Alec, what should we do then? Well, if this really is a desert in front of us, we should get water. Some deserts have rivers, but we don't know if this one does. Just to be safe, we should go back to the cold area of the mountains and fill our canteens with clean snow. So, by the time we reach the hot desert, it will have melted into drinkable water. Sounds like a plan, Chief. Okay, you can stop with the nicknames now. Mike rubs the back of his head, smiling like a child. They turn back and look for a clean snow to fill their canteens, then make their way to the biome's end to find a land filled with sand, cacti, and dead bushes. Welcome to the Grand Central Station of Sand! Yeah, pretty much. Destiny shakes her head. Making their way down the last mountain, they took off their boots and landed their cold feet in the warm sand. It soothed their shivering toes. Pulling their boots back on, they continued onward. Think we can find villages in the desert? Yeah, I've seen them plenty of times. Although, most of them are destroyed. Figures. They had been walking for hours, and they seemed to be getting nowhere. Everything, no matter which way they turned, looked the same. The sun no longer gave off a comforting warmth. Instead, it beat down, yelling at the two to stop their futile mission. Over time, the sun began to release its grip of heat and surrendered the coolness of night. It would be refreshing if it weren't for the fact that monsters would soon be appearing, with the sole desire to rip them limb from limb. Unlike in the mountains, there was no place to hide in the desert. They had no choice but to stand and fight. Well, let's hope you can show those amazing skills again. I'll try not to disappoint. They prepped themselves for the assault. The zombies groaned. The skeletons crackled their bones and readied their bows. And the creepers surrounded the duo. Back against one another, they pointed their blades in their respective directions. The zombies limped towards their targets, but would soon find themselves collapsing on the sandy ground as their limbs would be cut. Twirling in the air with inhuman speeds, Mike zipped past each zombie who would fall after he made his quick moves. He tried to balance dodging the skeletons with fighting the zombies when he looked over and saw Destiny. She fought with more swiftness and grace than he had seen from any warrior before. His mind started to grow fuzzy and he was losing focus. Suddenly, everything seemed clear and all his senses heightened. Seconds later, an agonizing pain filled his entire body and he collapsed onto the sand, feeling every tiny rock digging into him. In the midst of his distraction, a skeleton shot him in the arm. Fighting the pain, he gets back up on his feet and takes out the skeleton who had wounded him. The number of monsters surrounding them decreased with each passing moment. Many creepers, zombies, and skeletons had been slain. The battle went on and on, until finally when midnight struck, most of the remaining monsters had run for their undead lives. Meeting again, they assessed their own injuries. So, did I meet your expectations? Yeah. You definitely did. You all right there? You got a lot of blood pouring out of you. Destiny asked, hands on hip. I'll be fine. This is nothing. Mike said, holding his arm. Destiny was about to respond when she saw a figure reveal itself in the darkness. A green, armless terror right behind Mike's back. She tried to scream for him to move, but before she could... Boom. Sand and cacti went flying in the air, along with Mike. He hit the ground with a thud. 
He immediately tried to stand up again, but as soon as he put his body weight on his legs, they gave way under the pressure. He wanted to scream in agony, but he knew any sound could direct more monsters this way. Though he wasn't concerned for his own sake, he was more afraid of Destiny getting involved. Mike! She screamed as she ran to his side, not caring about the monsters that would hear. He laid on the ground, almost lifeless, but Destiny wasn't about to freeze again. Mike tried to get up. Weakness was never something he wanted to show. He was always strong, always able to keep going. Destiny makes her way over to Mike and kneels by his side. Destiny, no, it's fine. Shut up and let me help you. Destiny constantly checks over both shoulders to make sure no enemies were making their way towards them. She examined Mike's body to look for wounds. His front only suffered minor injuries, but since the creeper came up behind him and he landed on the ground on his back, his back half suffered extensive injury. If this had been stone he had landed on, he'd be in much worse shape. I'll be fine. Don't worry about me. Just help me up and we can get moving. No. We're not going anywhere with you in this condition. Please. I don't want to slow us down. Mike, just relax. Finally giving in, he puts his body to rest. Destiny turns him over and he ended up on his stomach, face in the sand. Quick to take action, Destiny lifts Mike from the chest up and supported him with one arm to keep him from drowning in sand. Continuing her search for the most heavily wounded area, she felt around his back, waiting for any sign of major discomfort. His muscular back was bleeding heavily, so she patted as much blood away as she could with a cloth she had made from leather found on one of her previous adventures. As she was patting, she felt Mike's breathing slowing down more and more. Her eyes snapped away from the blood and turned him around to find him barely still conscious. No, 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 Mike, you have to stay with me. Come on, stay with me. You can't fall asleep. Mike? Mike! Slowly, Mike found his entire world darkening. Until finally, he was in a complete pitch black void. He awaited in silence for some time, before he heard a faint voice calling his name. Michael! The voice calls again. Michael! Though at this point he did not have a mouth to speak with, he still managed to say, Who's there? A bright spot begins to conjure up in the darkness, and was getting close. Emitting this light was an old man. He slowly made his way to him. Is it true that you are the final legacy holder? Asked the man. What? Who are you? Where am I? How did I get here? How do you know that? Ah, silly me. Perhaps I should have introduced myself before I asked you any questions. My apologies, good sir. My name is Matthew, and I was the first legacy holder. What? I was the first of our bloodline to be gifted the legacy's power. Notch specifically came to me and gave me its power. But I had to learn all on my own how to use it. Mike struggled to come up with what to say. He didn't know if he was hallucinating, or if this was real. Your mentor is doing a poor job of teaching you to tap into your power. So it would seem that the burden lies on me now. You find yourself in troubling times, young legacy holder. Possibly the most dangerous time this world has ever known. And if it can't be stopped, it'll be the last time this world will ever know. Okay, so what can you teach me then? Your mentor is trying to make you believe that the legacy has been corrupted, when in reality, it was actually saved long ago. Notch was the one who was corrupted, so he created the legacy in order to give men powers they can use to destroy each other. I didn't use my power to destroy, so Notch tossed me aside and used the evil in my son to turn him into a monster. However, justice prevailed in the end. The legacy's power is now being used to continue that justice. Justice? Justice? You call the slaughter of millions of innocent people justice? Not innocent people, Michael. Those people deceive you. The villagers you lived with, the man you fight with, even the girl you travel with today, are all trying to break the balance. The true legacy holders need you. 
They need you to help them maintain the balance. I can take you to them right now, and they can complete your training. With your powers and theirs combined, you can finally bring the world to peace once more. The man stretched his wrinkled hand out to Mike. He stood there, deep in thought. Quickly now, I can't stay here much longer. Mike was puzzled. A part of him was screaming to take the old man's hand, but another was screaming to resist. The conflict inside him was bubbling, but Mike finally reached his decision. You're lying, he said, pointing at the old man. I've known Clyde and the others for years. I know they never do the vile things you claim. You're a wicked old man, trying to deceive me. The old man's eyes turned red with hate. His decrepit body began to melt away, and the bright light he was emitting also faded. Mike felt an overwhelming heat coming from that direction as well. But this wasn't like the heat of the desert. It was the heat of fire. Another light glows in the dark, but this one is far dimmer. Before his very eyes, he sees a huge cloud of black smoke, with two red eyes looking down on him. Shocks of electricity shoot in and out of the smoke. Your heart might be pure, but your soul is not. You'll find yourself in my service soon. That I can personally guarantee. The smoke says, as it dissipates in the air. With the disappearance of the smoky figure, the darkness returned. But not for long, as the darkness slowly gave way to the desert he had left off in. He opened his eyes slowly, to feel the beating of the sun on him. Letting out several coughs, he alerted Destiny to his awakening. You're awake? Oh, thank Notch. Are you alright? She asked after she ran back to his side. Yeah. Mike attempted to sit up. His bones ached and his body resisted, but the pain had dulled. He could hear his heart beating, and his back throbbed. A grimace showed on his face. Hey, slow down there. You got really injured when that creeper exploded. From what I can tell, you either bruised or broke a rib, at least. I'm just surprised we're not dead. Yeah, the oddest thing happened when you lost consciousness. The whole rest of the night there were no monsters. Not just none attacking us, but none at all, as far as the eye could see. It was like something stopped them from appearing. Odd. Well, let's not just sit here. This is a perfect chance to cover some ground. Not gonna happen. Just give yourself a day to heal a bit more. We aren't on a time crunch. What? Of course we are. The sooner we find this village, the quicker we can get back to training to stop the legacy holders. There's no way we can- Please. Just one day. Destiny pleaded. I thought I saw a well a little further ahead. I'm going to see if it has any water. Just... try to rest. Destiny walked off with the two canteens in her hand. Mike watched her disappear over the sand dunes. Why did he have to stay? Why couldn't they just keep going? A sharp pain in his side reminded him. He couldn't even move if he wanted to. Off past the dunes, a figure was watching. Heh. I always knew she was a smart one. Not smart enough, though. Page fulfilled. Book 1. Chapter 16. Discovery. The hours seemed like days. The days seemed like years. That's the way both Mike and Destiny would describe how slow time passed when they traveled through the seemingly endless desert. Mike could move again, thanks to the rest he was able to get. But he wasn't able to move very fast, much to his annoyance. Destiny looked back at him as he limped along. Do you want to stop and rest for a moment? No. Let's keep pushing on. You have to rest sometimes, you know. I'll rest when I'm dead. Well, you already almost died, so you're halfway there. Oh, ha ha! Very amusing. As they continued moving forward, they began to see some kind of structure in the distance. You think that's a village? Maybe, but I don't see the sandstone church anywhere. Usually that's the most noticeable thing to see in the distance. It looks way taller than any church I've ever seen. Wait, I think it's a temple! You think so? I'm like... 98% sure. It's not really relevant to what we're after. No, it's completely relevant. What if there's stuff we need in there? Fair point. Just watch out for traps. Oh yeah. Almost forgot they had those. As they closed the distance to the temple, they readied their weapons in case any unpleasant company happened to be waiting for them inside. 
They find no life forms whatsoever. Careful with each step they made. They lurked around the temple, looking for the hidden treasure. Destiny walked up the stairs to the top of the temple to get a view of the desert around, looking to see if any villages were in sight. She then heard a shout, then the sound of sandstone breaking. She ran back inside the temple to find a hole in the main room. The hole was deep, and Mike had fallen in. Seems you have a thing for falling down, don't ya? She yelled down to him. Very funny! He yelled back, but winces when an agonizing pain shoots up his leg. Anything different down there? Well, good news! I found the treasure! Bad news? I found the booby trap! Break the pressure plate! I can't see it! It's too dark! It's in the center of that small pit. Just break it so you can't activate the TNT below. Roger that! He reached out his hand to find the stone plate. He did so gently, so that if he finds it, it wouldn't be enough pressure to activate it. When he found the stone, he proceeded to break it. Now that the booby trap was disarmed, he was free to move about the small room. Destiny broke part of the ceiling of the temple, letting in sunlight from the sky to shine in on the pit below. Well, that helps. Mike found four chests in the pit. One on each wall. What's down there? Chests! Four of them! Look inside them! Oh, really? I thought I'd just leave them. Thought that'd be a fun idea. Real funny. Go look in them. Mike opened the first chest. He was surprised to find three emeralds sitting inside. Well, here's a good start. He said as he took the shiny jewel. Three gold ingots were also inside the chest, along with lots of rotten flesh. Closing the chest, he made his way to the second one. Opening it, he found a saddle. Deja vu. The other items in the chest were mere bones and gunpowder. Maybe the gunpowder could come to use in the future. Grabbing the gunpowder, he looked inside the third chest. Then he finds a bunch of spider eyes. Yeah, I'm just gonna ignore that one entirely. Making his way to the fourth and final chest, he rubs his hands together in preparation. He then opens the chest, listening to the creaking as it opens, and he sees one single item inside. A sword. But this was no ordinary sword. In fact, it was completely unlike any sword he had ever seen before. It wasn't gold, it wasn't iron, and it certainly wasn't diamond. It looked... white. But not white like iron. He grabs the sword by the handle and lifts it out of the chest. A small cloud of dust follows the blade on its way out. What is it? You know what? How about I just climb out of here so we don't have to rip out our vocal cords? Picking up some blocks. Mike towers his way back up to the main room of the temple. That's a unique looking sword. Agreed. It's not like any sword I've ever seen before. Maybe it's a new alloy? Or maybe even a new gemstone? Not likely. It's so light. Almost airy. Well, whatever it is, we should keep it to make sure no one else gets a hold of it. Why? Because we don't know how strong it is. Who knows? It might be even stronger than diamond. Oh. Alright then. Let's get moving. Roger that, chief! told you to stop calling me that. Putting the sword on his back, the two leave the temple, onward to the desert ahead. While they walked along, Mike constantly whipped the sword around, always making sure he was a safe distance from Destiny. You really like that thing, don't you? Yeah, it's so cool. It's so light, yet I feel like it will be useful. I can't wait to test its strength. You're like a child who just got a new toy. That's actually a pretty accurate comparison, he said, as he twirled the sword around. One thing I don't understand is why it's so void of color. Eh, doesn't really matter what it looks like, as long as it's strong. I suppose that's true. Wait, what's that sound? He said, twirling the sword around. <laughs> Off in the distance, there was a faint roar. Not that of a monster, something more natural. As they walked closer... The scent of fresh water and smoke filled the air. That's a river, isn't it? And a fire? No, not quite. I mean, there's definitely a river, but I smell wood and cooked fish. I think we might have found a village. Destiny cheered. Following the scents and sounds, they found a swift moving river. Destiny pointed to a small wooden bridge that crossed the river, over to the other side. Slowly walking towards it, they stopped at the middle of the bridge to watch the water flow down. That's one strong current. No kidding! Completing their cross of the river, they look in front of them. They could hardly believe their eyes. Houses made of sandstone, crops growing in the sun, torches hanging off black wool blocks, robed men and women roaming endlessly. They found it. They had finally found a village. 
This village seemed to have no sign of being attacked before. Either the legacy holders hadn't reached this village yet, or the villagers repaired all the damages done. All their hard work, going through the frigid mountains and crossing the blazing desert, it was all for this. They had reached their destination. Faith Fulfilled Book 1 Chapter 17 Not Like Us Honestly, I thought this would take a lot longer. Same, but let's just be thankful that it didn't. Mike and Destiny made their way towards the village entrance. Walking down the gravel road, the villagers watched them with anxiousness. They don't seem too happy to see us. I mean, if you think about it, outside of your little village, the rest of the world has been feeling the wrath of the legacy holders. I'm surprised they're even standing. Well, how are we supposed to prove that they can trust us? I have no idea. I have three emeralds. How is that supposed to help? Don't you know? Villagers are greedy. That doesn't erase the fact that you have a frickin' sword on your back. Besides, you shouldn't just assume that- Destiny started. But Mike had already jogged up to the village well, waving around the three emeralds. WE COME IN PEACE! A few villagers turned their attention toward him curiously. Just like cows to a bundle of wheat. Mike thought to himself. And that is my training partner? I don't even know why I bother. An iron golem rounds the corner and starts its way toward Mike. But before it could get close enough, a villager sticks their arm out to stop it. If you are in town for trading, then we will allow you to stay. Thank you. That actually worked. It's been quite some time since someone has come by to trade with us. Is that girl over there here to trade too? Yes, she is. Very good. Then let's get down to business. Destiny walked up to Mike and the villager. Business is all good, but if you allow us to stay here, we could go and collect more resources to trade with. The villager hesitates and assesses the situation. Were these two strangers going to be a threat to his village, or will they help profit the village? As he said before, in a less abrupt way, we bring no harm to your village and only wish for the guarantee of our safety as we stay here. Hmm. The villager eyed them, scanning up and down. Not many people come to this village. Our last visitor was ten years ago. Oh wow, that's a long time. Indeed. Answer me this. Why should we trust you? I... uh... You have no reason to trust us. Gollum stepped forward, preparing to attack. Destiny, what are you doing? Just trust me. She turned back to the villager. You have no reason to trust us. However, you also have no reason not to trust us. We promise to stay out of your way and not disturb this beautiful village you have. We only wish for a safe place to stay. After a long pause, the villager responded. Very well then. There is an extension of a path near the end of our village that you may build small homes off of. Thank you so much. Now that we have all that settled, allow me to show you around the village and where you may build your home. The villager leads Mike and Destiny through the village, showing them the houses and the blacksmith. The villager stops at the edge of the village where the path ends. All right then. I assume you two lovebirds want to share a house, correct? W what Oh, for Notch's sake. What? Mike's face turns crimson red. We aren't together. Oh, I'm sorry. I just assumed- The villager trails off as Mike's face continued to flame. The three of them sat there in growing awkward silence. Anywho, I'll leave you two alone to settle in. The villager then quickly escapes down the gravel path, leaving Mike and Destiny alone at the edge of the village. So, uh, is there a side of the road you prefer? Not really. Only problem is I don't think I have enough materials for a house. I mean, we can ask for more materials. Don't. We don't want to bother them. Plus, we're in a desert. You said it yourself. This is the Grand Central Station of Sand. I'll just go collect some real quick. Right. Okay. Emptying their bags, they place down chests to store their items. They also put down their crafting tables and furnaces. The two of them began to compress sand into sandstone and build up their small homes. Once they had everything set, the sun had begun to set. Ever since Mike had arrived at Ray's, he had had no time to himself. It felt nice. Making his way outside, he watched as several iron golems patrolled the gravel streets for any incoming monsters. Taking a seat on the small stairs at the doorway, Mike looked up at the starry sky above. Feels like nothing's changed since that night. And yet... Mike shifted his gaze across the street. He saw Destiny's silhouette approach a torch and blow it out. The fatigue of the day started catching up with Mike, and he decided to rest for the night ready to observe this isolated village's behavior in the morning. For the most part, the village seemed normal. 
Villagers traded with each other, maintained their houses, and went about their day. The only new thing was that Mike had never seen iron golems in person before. He had heard of them, of course, but never really believed that they existed. One had even offered him a flower. Where did you get this? The golem just stared at him, holding his stiff arm out. Mike took the flower and the golem walked away. Okay then, and they're supposed to be the protectors of this place? You'd be surprised how tough they are. Throwing zombies across biomes is no easy feat. Not that we ever worry about that sort of thing. Go! Where'd you come from? And did you just say you don't worry about zombies? I come from everywhere and nowhere at the same time. I am beyond what you can see, yet right in front of your face. Huh? I'm sorry, I can't understand what you just said. One does not need to understand in order to make sense of the world. The villager walks off toward the main market. Mike stares in the direction he left. Okay, so the people in this village are a little loopy in the head. All right, noted. This place is beautiful. Destiny had been walking around the town, and in just one day, she had seen the town square, which was decorated with string lights and paper lanterns, and the marketplace full of all sorts of new spices and foods she had never smelled before. One section was filled with booth after booth of sweets, and across from it was rows of savory snacks. Even if the houses surrounding the center of the town were bland, the rest of it certainly wasn't. She had even met a few of the villagers, listening to their stories of how they found the village and made a home in their safe haven. Destiny could tell that they were very spiritual people, some claiming they met Notch and that he told them to come here. However, she still couldn't understand why they had considered the village a safe haven. They were in a desert after all. There were bound to be monsters everywhere at night. When Mike and Destiny met at the center of the village, she told them all about the amazing things she saw and cool things she heard from the villagers she had met. This one villager said he had heard Notch's voice telling him to come to the village. Isn't that cool? Yeah, and I had a guy who wanted to touch my hair. Oh, and another guy who wanted to know what I smelled like. Sounds fun. Oh yeah, it sure was. Fulfilled. Book 1, Chapter 18 don't worry. Oh my gosh, just try it. It's not gonna kill you. No, but it will make me puke probably. You don't see me puking, do you? It's a freaking cactus, not poison. Exactly! It's cactus! And it's not meant to be eaten! You're insane for eating that! Well, clearly someone eats it since it's almost sold out. Yeah, people with terrible, no, dangerous tastes! You act like the spines are gonna stab you and run off with your girlfriend. Just pull them off. Ha! <laughs> Joke's on you! I don't have a girlfriend! Wait. Wow. Shocker there. Oh, and you have a boyfriend? Don't need one. Just me, myself, and I. And Ray, apparently. Jerk! Screw you! We're really going there? How many times have I saved your life? Okay, fine, fine. I was just messing with you. I mean, I've saved Clyde 40 times over, and he still gives me crap. Yeah, that's because he has the mental capabilities of a baby. See that, we can agree on. You're still a jerk, though. And you're still a weirdo. Excuse me, you two. You're kinda making a scene. Oh, sorry about that. It was all her fault, though. Hey! Well, seeing as you two have so much energy, I assume you'll be partaking in tonight's party. Party? Oh yes, every month we have a massive celebration. What are you celebrating? We, uh... Uh... Well? I'm not quite sure. Seriously? Well, the parties are fun. So, will you be joining us? Isn't that dangerous? All the noise could attract monsters. Don't you worry. Our town is guarded by iron golems. There's no way any baddies could get in here. Are you sure about that? Positive. Well, if you do want to join in, you're more than welcome. Anyway, I gotta get back to preparing. See you later. The villager heavily walks away. What? What did I just witness? I don't know. I'm worried. They're literally asking to get raided by zombies if they're going to be doing that. I know. We'll have to just observe this. This is definitely part of their behavior, so under Ray's instructions, we will watch. Mike stares out into the distance, looking out over the endless desert. You okay? Something's out there. What do you mean? Something... no. Someone is out there, heading this way. They're not close. But I'm sure they're coming. How do you know? Farther into the desert ahead, 
Two figures in black make their way across. How much farther? Not too long now. I've waited all this time for a rematch. I can wait a little longer. Why didn't we just attack them when they were traveling in the taiga? Ugh, you fool. Brian specifically ordered us not to attack them at that time. He said to allow them to find the village. They led us to this village, and now we will destroy it along with the Legacy Holder's friend. But we just have to kill his friend. We don't have to attack the villagers too. Sometimes I wonder why I keep you around. I don't. I think the sun is just getting to you. Maybe you should get some shade. You're probably right. Destiny was surprised. She was expecting an immediate refusal, but he was actually taking care of himself. How hard did he hit his head when he fell? Mike slowly walked back into the village and into his hut. Once inside, he sat down on a chair he had made himself and looked out the window. This feeling he was experiencing, he couldn't explain it. It was almost like fear, but different. The sun sets over the sandy lands. As the moon rises, every villager gets their party hats on and gets ready to rock the night away. The party lasted for hours. Everyone was in the town square dancing with each other. Villagers were eating all sorts of food and playing music. Little kids were running around playing and screaming at each other. Mike and Destiny had never been to a party, or at least never one this big. Everyone looked beautiful with all sorts of colored lights. There was even a fire pit in the center of the square. Villagers huddled around the fire to warm up with their loved ones and tell stories. Destiny had gone over to listen to all the stories. She seemed to start enjoying herself, even dancing along to some songs. But Mike couldn't bring himself to have fun. He looked around and noticed that there were iron golems at the party, but they weren't on guard. They were partying with the villagers, giving each other flowers and smiling. Mike spotted the villager who had been helping them and walked over to him. Hey, um, I thought you said the iron golems would be on guard patrolling the village. Oh, are they not? Eh, oh well, that's fine. Are they at least enjoying themselves? Aren't you at least a little worried about being attacked? Eh, not really. Come on, dance, have fun. Your girlfriend is. Again, she's not my girlfriend. Mike and Destiny sitting in a tree. K-I-S-S-I-N-G. The villager was clearly drunk. Yeah. You, sir, have lost your marbles. I'm gonna have to ask you to get your horrific breath away from my nose. Ah, uh, don't be such a downer. Have some fun! Drink a little before the fireworks start. It makes them more colorful! First of all, I don't drink. Second of all, I'm not here to have fun. And neither is Destiny, so I have no idea why she's messing around. Thirdly, you are all putting yourselves in danger by making all this ruckus. Oh yeah, and fourth, those fireworks don't need to be more colorful when you're so drunk you can't see straight. Look, there's no reason to worry. We haven't had zombies enter our village for decades. If you're just gonna bring the mood down, we'd prefer you go back to your house. Mike, come on, they're playing my favorite song. Destiny. Grabbing him by the collar of his shirt, Destiny pulled him to the center of the dance floor. Uh, Destiny, what are you- Shut up and dance. Mike stood frozen in the center and watched Destiny dance. She skipped in circles around him, hopping from foot to foot, with her arms in the air and a gigantic smile on her face. She linked arms with villager after villager, pulling them all close to the dance floor, encouraging them all to dance with her. What the heck are you doing? Finally having some fun for the first time in weeks. Come on. I, uh, don't know how to dance. You don't need to know. Just let yourself lose. But the noise! The monsters! She walked up to him and grabbed his hands. There have been no monsters all night. Or any since we've been here. Just come on and dance with me. Uh, okay. Mike begins to blush. Destiny beamed and pulled Mike into a spin. He was wobbly and unsteady for a little bit. But eventually he started to feel the beat and get into a rhythm. This was the happiest he had seen Destiny. Ever. Her green eyes sparkled in the firelight, and her smile was so big it could be seen from miles away. Mike found himself staring at her. For so long, in fact, he hardly noticed how close he was getting to the fire. Hey, don't burn yourself. Destiny said, laughing. A circle of villagers had formed around the duo, some dancing with them and some just watching. They were excited to see that these new visitors had found their village so fun. When the song ended, the two were on the ground laughing. Wow. They're so beautiful. Yeah. 
They really are, Mike said softly. Only he wasn't looking at the fireworks. He was looking right at Destiny. You know, this place is much different than what I expected. Everyone here is so happy and carefree. All these people have such amazing stories. The weird part, though, is that I've heard so many stories of how people arrived here and how their life has been here, but no one seems to remember any part of their life before they started traveling to this village. No details, no specific memories, but they all have this negative feeling toward it, even though they don't know what happened. Maybe it was just too traumatizing. No. I've seen trauma. You might repress parts of your life, but you don't forget it entirely. Unless... Her eyes sparkled as she looked up into the sky. Unless... what? Huh? Oh, never mind. Forget I said anything. Uh, okay then. Mike put his hand on his forehead. Did I really tire you out that much? No. It's that feeling again. What feeling? Remember when I said someone was coming? It's that same feeling I felt, but this time it's... Suddenly, the two heard a cry in the distance. What was that? I don't know, but it doesn't sound good. Let's go. They rush off in the direction they heard the cry. It was back toward where their houses were. When Mike saw them, he stopped. Holding Destiny back, in front of their houses was the villager who had greeted them, and two mysterious figures. He was on his knees, and the two figures were looming their swords above him. Mike heard a familiar voice. Where are they? The voice said menacingly. Please don't hurt me! We point we will hurt you if you tell us where they are. Shut up, Kyle! Both of the voices now sounding familiar. It was the two strangers that had attacked Mike weeks ago. But what were they doing here? Mike, why are we just standing here? We need to help him. I know who they are. You what? Well, I don't know them, but I recognize their voices. They're the ones who attacked me back at home. Those monsters? We need to help him now. Shh! They'll hear you. They're powerful, so we need to sneak up on them. Got it. They slowly made their way behind Destiny's house and onto the roof. The villager was still on his knees. He saw the two, but Mike put a finger to his lips, signaling for the villager not to give them away. Mike jumped off the roof, and just as he was about to strike, he noticed one of the strangers was gone. The remaining stranger whipped around and struck their sword with his. Mike was knocked to the ground and his sword flew from his hands. The stranger loomed over him, her dark blue eyes strikingly cold. Ah, uh, just the man we were looking for. He heard a grunt and a thud. He looked over to see Destiny unconscious on the ground, and the other stranger standing above her. Ebony laughed. You know, you should really learn to be more quiet at night. Faith Fulfilled, Book 1, Chapter 19, Glow of Hope. So, after all this time, I finally get to have a rematch. Rematch? I'm pretty sure we've never fought. What? Because like a coward, you sent your confused friend to fight me instead. He was merely used to test your abilities. Now that I've seen them, I can say that you have a lot to learn, child. Well... We'll see how long you'll be talking trash after your face has a few new... tattoos, shall we say. Well, good luck with that. Ebony's eyes widen with insanity as she starts her fighting stance. Mike raises his blade above his head, signifying his own. I've watched your moves. I know your techniques. This will not take long. Do you want to fight or talk? Because ever since I laid eyes on that horrific face of yours, all you've done is talk. Ebony releases a wicked grin, and steps forward. Wait a minute. If I fight here, I'll be putting all these innocent villagers in danger. I'll have to lure her to an empty area so I can go all out without having to worry about the safety of the others. Plus, getting her away from Destiny should allow for someone to go and get her medical attention. Mike thought to himself. Taking a few steps back, Mike points his blade at his foe. A confident smile makes its way across his lips. When consciousness returns to Destiny, she looked up to see Ebony's back just a few feet from her. All she wanted to do was stick her sword right through it. Mike looked down at Destiny and gave her a small shake of the head to tell her he had the situation under control. Keeping still, as to not draw attention to herself, Destiny watched as the two fighters stayed perfectly still. 
waiting for the other to make the first move. With a swift turn, Mike runs away from the scene. Just as he predicted, Ebony followed behind. Making his way around the town, Mike was careful not to run into any areas with panicking villagers, as to keep them out of harm's way. What Mike didn't anticipate, though, was Ebony's speed. She was gaining on him, and fast. He had to find an exit soon before she catches him. Keeping his eyes on what was in front of him, he saw the gate that he and Destiny went through to enter the village. He bolted towards it as fast as he possibly could. The gate broke apart when he bashed his way through, with Ebony following close behind. He still wanted to go a little further, as to keep their fight away from the entire village. When he felt he was far enough, he turned around and stopped. Ebony stopped as well, mere feet away from him. So, this is the all-powerful legacy holder that my master warned me about, who supposedly has the power to break the fabric of time itself? What a joke. You wasted your energy trying to run from me. Run from you? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. There was a plan behind it, but all you know how to do is hurt and destroy. So it doesn't surprise me that your feeble mind couldn't figure it out. What? How dare you? That's enough chit-chat. You wanted a fight, now you got one. Mike raises his sword above his head and plants his feet firmly in the sand. Ebony swings her blade around in preparation. Again, they face each other, unmoving. The night breeze blows the sand around them. The moonlight from the sky shines down on the fight about to go down. Ebony looks on at Mike with hatred, while he looks at her with a confident smile. He waves his white sword in the air and charges at Ebony who never stopped smiling as he made his way over. Even though Mike had let the first attacker out of the village, Destiny knew that at least one more threat still existed somewhere. Before she could search for him, she had to evacuate the panicking villagers to a safe area though. Once the village was empty, she searched around the town to hunt down the second stranger. Kyle hid inside one of the smaller houses in the village. He knew his orders were to kill Destiny, but could he really go through with it? If this curse wasn't on me, I wouldn't have to do any of this. Kyle muttered. I know you're out there somewhere! Kyle's heart stopped. You've got a lot of nerve, attacking defenseless villagers, but then when someone who can defend herself comes around, you hide. You're a coward. I could say I'm more of a man than you. Kyle clenched his fists. Either you come out and face me, or I'm gonna find you and take you out. Your choice! Kyle burst through the door and jumped out at Destiny. She was slightly off guard, but she was still able to block his attack. Blinded by pure rage, he slashed his blade at Destiny, pushing her through the streets. While Kyle and Destiny battled through the village, Mike and Ebony were locked in a deadly duel. Ebony's skill with the blade was extraordinary, but so was Mike's. Their battle was evenly matched. Mike breaks the blade lock and hurls into the air. Letting gravity pull him down, he tries to smash his feet into Ebony's skull. Jumping out of the way, Ebony watches as his body slams into the ground. Looking back up, Mike blocks a punch and knocks his head into hers. Ebony yelps in pain as she covers her face. As blood drips out of her nose, she gets back to her feet and stares at him. Both fighters put their hands on their heads. Well, as the warm-ups go, I'd say that wasn't too bad. That was just her warm-up? <laughs> Time to get serious. Mike goes into a defensive stance, ready for her next attack. In a flash, Ebony strikes at his arm. He moves to dodge, but a small cut makes its way to his arm. Blood drips to the sand below. Out of anger from his pain, Mike charges Ebony, throwing punches, kicks, and sword slashes in her direction. She blocks every attack with ease. Kyle continues pushing Destiny through the town. His attacks were strong, yes, but they were wild and out of control. Destiny had no problem dodging each one. Unlike Ebony, who can move at incredible speeds thanks to her light build, Kyle is muscular and large. As such, his weight anchors him down. With every move Kyle makes, he uses up some of his energy. Destiny knew that if she just kept away from his attacks long enough, he would eventually tire out, jumping, rolling, blocking with her blade and hands. That's all she did when going through the village. Kyle's breath began to get heavier, and he was starting to get slower. Destiny noticed the shift and began her own offensive attacks. Have our pawns made their way to the village? Yes, father. They are currently battling Mike and his friend as we speak. And? Ebony and Mike were on par with one another at first. But Ebony is taking it seriously now and is pushing him back. Excellent. 
But Kyle let his anger take over and used up all of his energy mindlessly attacking the girl. Now that he is drained, the girl is soon to overwhelm him. Andrew growled in anger. I knew that child was going to be no use to us. I should have destroyed him myself. I assure you, father, you have nothing to fear. I'm sure once Ebony takes Mike out of commission, she'll set her sights on the girl next. Did you follow through on my orders and tell her to not kill Mike? Yes, father. Good, because I have so many plans for him. Ebony's attacks were brutal and were so hard to anticipate or dodge. Mike was taking so much damage, it was inconceivable that someone without the power of the Legacy could be this strong. I've seen what Legacy holders are capable of, so why don't you show me that hidden power of yours before it's too late for your friend? Ebony kicks Mike in the chest, sending him several feet behind. Rolling onto the sand, he coughs up blood, struggling to his feet. He can only watch as Ebony takes a jab of her sword right into his leg, yelling in agony. He collapses onto the ground and blood spews in all directions. Well, if you won't show me your power, then your friend's death is on your hands. Ebony lands one final kick to Mike's head, knocking him out. She knew her orders were to leave Mike alive, but she wanted so very badly to kill him right then and there. Resisting the urge to end his life, she turns and heads back toward the village. Kyle had his head against a house, with Destiny's blade pointed at him. Stand down. Kyle gasped for breath as he shook with fear at the possibility of his life ending right here and now. In the distance, he could see Ebony approaching. She's come to save me? Kyle thought to himself. Destiny could hear footsteps on the gravel road. Turning to face the sound, she saw Ebony standing there. Minor wounds covered her body from her fight with Mike. Destiny's eyes widened, but not with fear of Ebony, but in fear of what had happened to Mike. What did you do with him? Oh. I took him down a few notches. Destiny clenched her fist. He won't be here to save you this time. Ebony said, pointing out her sword, dripping with Mike's blood. Seeing the sword with his blood, Destiny was enraged. Oh, don't be sad. He fought well. So I granted him a warrior's death. You, though, will die like the insect you are. Mike lays on the ground, completely out cold, blood still leaking from his body. Once again, he finds himself in a black void. But this one is different from the other. In the last one, it was completely unfeeling. His body was numb. But this time, it was warm. It was comforting warmth. Just like before, a figure can be seen illuminating the darkness. He was a bald man with a brown shirt, black eyes, and a black beard. He walked up to Mike. I'm not going to be fooled by your trickery. Trickery? Oh. You need not fear me. That voice! I feel like I've heard it before. Mike thought to himself. Well, of course you've heard my voice before. We've spoken to each other in the past. What? But I don't recognize you! That's because you've only heard me. You've never actually seen me. Well, who are you then? Who are you? It's the real question, my boy. I'm Mike. Oh no, I don't. I mean, who you truly are. I... I... don't know. You're not fooling anyone. We both know who you are. I'm no one. I'm just a man who can't protect anyone. You saved Clyde's life 40 times. I think that's quite an impressive feat. Wait, how do you know that? Michael, my name is Notch. I am the creator of the legacy. You're Notch? Indeed I am. You find yourself at an important stage in the course of your history. If you don't stop those assassins, all will be lost. I can't. I can't, Notch. I'm sorry, but I just always fail. Michael, you are a legacy holder. It's your duty to bring balance to the world. But I can't even use my power. I'm a failure. You're not failing, my boy. You were brought up in a different way than any previous legacy holder. The others were taught of the legacy's power and exposed to it from a young age. You weren't. You lived like a normal person. 
It's not your fault at all, Mike. Well, I still can't stop that assassin. She's just so fast and so strong. Maybe if I could use my power, I could stop her. And I can help with that. W what do you mean? Let me take control of your body just for a brief time. I can use the Legacy's power on you to take down the assassins. I don't know. You have my word. Once the job is done, I will give your body back to you. Hmm. There is little time, Michael. Alright, let's do it. The void and Notch fades away. Destiny and Ebony fought throughout the town, and Ebony easily overpowered her. You're pathetic. I thought I'd at least have a little challenge with you. But this was all too easy. Destiny puts her arms over her face to cover her eyes from the fatal blow that was about to hit her. Ebony lifted her sword in the air, ready to deliver the final shot. But before she could, she heard a voice say, Ebony! She turned around to see Mike standing there with his sword in hand. His wounds were completely healed. What? You? I thought I had you down for the count! You can destroy villages, but you can never destroy what I am. It's time to finish this! An explosion of yellow lights illuminated from Mike's body. The darkness of night surrendered to his overpowering glow. When the shining ceased, Mike had an aura of yellow light surrounding his body. His sword, which was normally a clear white, was illuminating a bright blue. No way. I thought that sword was destroyed. Destiny quickly got to her feet and scrambled to get away from the impending battle. Ebony stood in her fighting stance, ready for the fight of her life. Kyle looked on with fear at what he was witnessing. The world stood still. Notch had finally returned. Faith Fulfilled, Book 1, Chapter 20 Monster How do you know my name? I never told you it. I am your maker. That's how I know it. Destiny was overjoyed to see that Mike was still alive, but she was also confused. What happened to his voice? It sounds completely different. And how did he get all this power? Ebony stood in her battle stance, sweat drenching her clothes. Her feet trembled in the sand. With a swift kick forward, she lunged at Mike ready to deliver. But before she could reach him, he disappeared. What? Reappearing behind her, he throws a kick on the back of her head, sending her pummeling to the sand. Mike kept his foot raised as Ebony struggled to her feet. Rubbing the back of her head, she looks on at Mike with hate. You'll pay for that. Mike disappears again to the shock of everyone watching. Ebony looked in all directions to find her attacker, but he was nowhere in sight. What? Where is he? Right behind you. Spinning around, Ebony swung at Mike's face. He raised his hand with the smallest of effort to block the attack. Ebony's anger began to boil inside her. Mike lifts his spare hand and points it at Ebony's face. Suddenly, a gust of wind blows and Ebony is sent flying into the village behind. The sandstone houses she crashes into shatters into pieces as she hits it with full force. No words. No words could come to the mouths or minds of the spectators witnessing this. Ebony, the woman who was humiliating Mike mere moments ago, is now literally being backed into a corner. Disappearing and reappearing in front of Ebony, Mike's aura illuminates the darkened village. Looking down on Ebony, he waits for her to get back to her feet. She grits her teeth and continues to tremble. You feel that? That fear you're experiencing? That's the same feeling all your victims felt before you ended their lives. I'm not scared of you, child. Ebony flies at Mike with her sword in hand. Raising but a finger, he blocks the sword's slash. Under any normal circumstances, his finger would have been chopped right off. But these weren't normal circumstances. And this wasn't a normal fighter. This was Notch. With one finger alone, he stopped her blade. Pulling back, Ebony looked on with absolute horror at the power of being demonstrated before her very eyes. She was paralyzed with fear. Continuing to look on at Ebony, Mike said, Every force I create has an echo. Your own bad energy will be your undoing. Opening the palms of his hands, a bright light exits his palms and makes their way towards Ebony. The light strikes her body, leaving massive damage on her. Gliding towards her without moving his feet, he lands two swift kicks to her head, each one generating more light energy. Mike swirled his hands around and around, generating a giant dust devil from the sand in the desert. 
The wind from the sandy tornado was overwhelming. Throwing the twister at her, she was sucked into it. Ebony screamed as she was thrown around like a toy by the merciless force of nature. With a clap of his hands, the twister dissipated, and Ebony fell to the ground, writhing in agony. She looked over at Mike as he slowly approached, pointing his blue blade toward Ebony from a distance. She could only watch as the sword generated a small ray of light with all the colors of the rainbow. Pure, positive light energy. Is he going to set me free? The energy bolt blasts toward Ebony, pushing her far into the sky. Leaping into the sky, he gets on the same level and with one final blow, pushes her miles and miles away, out of sight. Landing on his feet, Mike looks up at the sky to find she is gone. Blinded by pure terror, Kyle had run away from the scene. Destiny was far too distracted by what Mike was doing to see Kyle escape. Mike's world turned into the void once again, and saw Notch standing in front of him once more. The job is done. Is... is she dead? Oh no, far from it. I made sure that she falls safely into a lake. What? Why would you let her escape? There are some things that must remain unspoken. Remember this feeling when you want to bring back your power. Wait, what? You still have lots more training to do, but now you can tap into your power. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Now, Michael? Y yes Never forget who you are. You are a legacy holder. It's up to you to restore balance to the world. I won't forget. Good. When you reunite with Clive and travel east, the next stage of your journey takes place with the structure of knowledge. Long forgotten, but can still be found. What? Beware of temptation, and beware of your inner darkness. Don't let your guard down, because they will overtake you. What are you talking about? Good luck, Mike. And remember, I will always be with you. Always. Notch begins to fade. Wait, no! Come back! Notch and the Void finally fade away, watching from a short distance away. Destiny watches as the bright aura disappears from Mike's body, and he collapses onto the ground, completely drained. She ran over to his side as fast as she could. He was awake, and still breathing. Hey, how'd I do? Destiny said nothing, and pulled him into an embrace. She thought she had lost him when Ebony returned to the village. Seeing him still alive, she couldn't resist the urge to hug him. Though he was almost completely drained of energy, his body still managed to flush his face a deep red. You blockhead. You had me worried sick. Destiny helped Mike back up to his feet and put his arm over her shoulder so she could support him. That seems to be a common insult people use towards me. Are you alright? I'm fine. I'm just exhausted. I bet. Slowly taking him back to the village, she laid him down on his bed in his hut. Afterward, she went to where the villagers were all hiding now to tell them the coast was clear and they could return home. Once she led them all back, she returned to Mike's side. He was out. Out like a light. Days went by, but Destiny never left Mike's side. All that raw power that Notch under unleashed took a toll on Mike's body. While it didn't injure him, it did drain him of every last drop of energy. But now that he had his time to rest, he was back to full health again. Thank you, Destiny, for staying here and keeping me company. Destiny nods her head. So, what exactly happened out there? You became something different. Your voice sounded different, and you shined this really bright light from your body. It's a long story, but to sum it all up, I think I can access my powers now. Really? I'll have to test it to be sure, but I think so. The hut's door knocked. Destiny came over to open it, and found an angry villager at the doorstep. You two need to leave. Now. What? Why? You two have caused our village to be attacked! Twenty of us were murdered! And it's all your fault. If you and that boyfriend of yours never came, we'd be safe and sound for the rest of eternity! Why, you ungrateful little... If it wasn't for Mike over there, a lot more than just twenty of you would be dead right now. Oh yeah? Well, if it wasn't for him at all, none of us would be dead! How do you know that? You and your people were making so much noise. That's probably what brought them here. Were you not a part of the making of all that noise? Destiny said nothing. 
That's what I thought. I want you and that monster out of our village. Now! Monster? You don't think we saw? He's a legacy holder! He came here just to kill us! When he finished that sentence, the villager was met with a swift slap right across his cheek. Putting a hand on his burning cheek, he glared at her. Behind him stepped forth an iron golem, ready to pummel her. Accepting her defeat, she put her hands down and said, Give us ten minutes, and we'll leave. That's all I request. The iron golem looked down at the villager, as if he was asking what he should do. The villager sighed. Very well. Ten minutes. If I find you still here, the iron golems will force you out. Closing the door, Destiny looked over at Mike who was staring at the sandstone floor. Monster. He thought to himself. Don't listen to him, Michael. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah. Let's just get going. We don't have a lot of time. When they made their way out of the hut and through the town, they were met with a small crowd of angry villagers. Through the way out, they called Mike a monster, a demon, a freak, a beast. But through it all, he never stopped looking down. He almost walked into walls a few times, and they only laughed and continued their bombardment of curses. When the onslaught of name-calling and mutters of fear finally stopped, they were several miles away from the village. Destiny had no words to describe the horrid sights that she had just experienced. This man risked his own life to protect them, and in return, they bashed him. Mike predicted that Destiny was going to say something and retorted, I'm fine. Don't worry about me. Let's just head back to Ray and Clyde. Of course I'm gonna be worried. Mike said nothing and continued to move on. Their journey lasted weeks, and Mike barely ever said a word. The trip seemed like forever, but they did finally make it back to Ray's. When Mike got back, Clyde was overjoyed. Hey, you're finally back! Hey, Clyde. How was your training with Ray? It was brutal. But very effective, I must say. He says I've improved greatly in this last month. That's good to hear. So you guys want to see Ray? No. We just got back from a long and hard trip. We need to rest. Oh, yeah. All right, then. You coming back to the cabin, Mike? Yeah. Actually, Mike, can I talk to you in private first? Oh, uh, sure. Huh? Oh, I see what's going on here. Gotta have one last smooching session before you get pummeled by Ray. Clyde, I swear to Notch, I will end you. Get out of here, Clyde! All right, all right. I'll let you lovebirds have your privacy. Clyde then ran before either of them could respond. Ugh, what a nuisance. What's going on? Why did you need to talk? You were so silent on the trip back here. I just want to know if you're alright. I'm fine. A short silence follows. I just want you to know, you're not a monster. He looked up at her. They were there looking for me. If I hadn't have been there, the village would have never been attacked. You saved them. You saved all of them, including me. They should have been thanking you, but they were just so ungrateful. You're not a monster, and you never will be. But I didn't save all of them. You saw them digging up the graves for their people. A short silence follows. Middle light snow begins to fall. Just, no matter what happens, I will always be here for you. I promise. You promise? Yes. I remember you telling me when we were talking during that snowstorm in the taiga biome that you honor people who stay true to their word. Well, I promise to always be there for you. You have my word. Well, the same goes for both sides, then. Destiny then pulls Mike in for another embrace in the cold night. There, in Destiny's warm arms, he felt something he hasn't felt for years. Comfort. And just like that, the snow began to fall and an unbreakable bond was formed. Ah! So you're telling me that you got beaten by a legacy holder who couldn't even use his power? No, not exactly. Explain yourself then, Mutt. When he fought me near the end, his voice changed. And then he had this aura around him. It was a bright yellow. The power he used. He shot pure light out of his hands. And... you're sure? Positive. I've never seen anything like this before. I see. But there's even more to it than that. Oh. 
And that would be? He has the first blade. Brian's heart stopped. How do you know? When he tapped into his power, the blade glowed blue. Brian walked over to his throne, sitting down and putting his hands on his forehead. Anything else? No, Master. Very well. You may leave now. Nodding her head, she turns and leaves the room. So, Notch, after all these years, you finally decided to play your cards? Well, we'll see who has the last card to play once Father is brought back to this realm.